Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. I'm sorry for what happened to you. Well, don't be. I'm not fishing for sympathy here. I did the crime. I'm doing the time. Time isn't doing me. I do my own time, not the institutions. See, to hold on to who you are in there, you dedicate yourself to your podcast. You work out your body (laughs) and your mind. (laughs) There should be a whole prequel that's him in prison. Just getting jacked? Yeah, that's like Brawl in Cell Block 99, right? Like, that's just him thumping people in prison. I, I like this movie, but the establishment of him... In prison, you're just like, this is the movie I want to be watching. Sure. What the fuck has this guy been doing? Well, right. I mean, and the prison thing, I feel like, is mostly there. So it's like, so that's why he's good at fighting and right. stuff. Because of prison. Right. He learned all of it in prison. Like, to tape magazines to himself. <sighs> Fucking. You know, but the, the battle battle magazine towel, body armor. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. And it's great. But right. I want to see, like, Black Hat Origins. This is all you need to know about Black Hat. And we could almost end the episode here. It is one of the biggest flops of the last 10 years. True. And it is a two-plus-hour movie about the world's sexiest computer hacker that ends with Thor wrapped up in magazines challenging a man to a screwdriver fight. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Challenging, like, a portly Dutch guy who's not famous. Right. Like, it's not like it's, like, him versus insert other marquee idol here. Like, him and Christian Bale finally meet no the man who up until this point his his biggest credit was the rapist and girl with the dragon tattoo right and then the other guy is the chechen from the dark knight yes right there's the those are those are the two final bosses and he's screwdrivers (laughs) screwdriver um can't get more analog than that that's true that's see that's this part of my whole take on the movie the magazines oh no of course right he's going primal well the other thing that you need to mention and people say print is dead right Print's keeping him alive. The other thing you need to know in your one sentence pitch is print kills. (laughs) Um, Is that, uh, oh, and also in the original version of the movie, a nuclear meltdown happened at the start and it was moved near the end and made no difference. Like, you know, it was fine being moved, right? You know what I mean? Like they almost put it in the wrong place. Okay, let's get the introductions out of the way because we need to talk about the the placement of that piece and the questions it arises (laughs) in both cuts of the movie. Because this is a podcast called Blank Check. I'm Griffin. I'm David. Sim. Newman. Our name is Griffin David Sims Newman. That's right. And we're, we're beginning to merge into one. Being. We're becoming one creature. Right. Uh, it's a podcast called Blank Check. It's about filmographies. We're going to be the one friend. Who have passive <laughs> success early on in their career. They give a series of blank checks, make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce baby. And this, we've, we've hit it. This is the final film. This is it? And who knows? Is this it? That's my question. We have a guest. You can got, talk. I mean, has, well, you, has you know, is a real student of this man's work and his career and has spoken to him many times. Do you get the sense that, that this might be the swan song or do you feel like he's going to make another one happen? I think he definitely wants to make another mm-hmm. one. I mean, I don't okay. he, this was not meant to be his. Right, he's not making song. this thinking like I'm going to end on no. Hemsworth wrapped in magazine. <laughs> and he has set up Salute, several films Hollywood. since this movie. Right, they've announced, they've cast, and then the films have fallen apart. Yeah, although with him, I I get the sense nothing ever really falls apart. Sure, uh, it just I mean, gets like deep yeah. backburnered, and who right. knows? Yeah, and he's always working on different things, and I think he also, I mean, he's been working on this. Uh, Huey miniseries mm-hmm. um, based on this book about the Vietnam War. Uh, and last time I talked to him, he had just come back from Vietnam. Where he was location scouting, although I don't know if that means that it's a go project or if right. he's just location scouting because he's, you know, kind of he's an obsessively that. busy person. Yeah, I imagine he's a guy who does two years of location scouting. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, I mean, Self-funded. On a movie that never happened. Yeah, right. And you guys probably talked about this, but, like, Heat is the perfect example of a movie that, like, yes. he worked on for, for years. Right. right. And then, like, made it. Yeah. <laughs> and then was like, eh, actually, I'm going to do it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm never finished making a movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what's crazy about the uh, the, the nuclear meltdown sequence in this movie. Mm-hmm. is that uh, you feel like putting it at the beginning was him going like, I don't know, why not try it? 
Right. It was a last second idea that then was the made it the second that they had to strike up the DCPs. Right. And then it came out in theaters that way. And then he it's immediately like, huh. went like, nah, not a good idea. Yeah, why is that there? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Like, there's sort of no finality to the idea of the movie being released to him. That's Michael Mann. Right. It's like, that's yeah. just the first version. Right. Yeah. Um, we're talking about Michael Mann, of course. We're Michael Mansplaining. This main series is called The Cast of the Podhecans. Today we're talking about Black Cat. And our guest is the great Bill Gardering. Hello. He's back. He's back, baby. Back in Black Hat. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So let's talk about Tenet, people. No, I'm not, I'm kidding. Just last time you were here, we were talking to Nolan. We were talking to oh, Nolan. That's right. We're yeah. pretty amped, uh, David and I, about the fact that that movie is titled Tenet. Tenet. It's yep. pretty thrilling to see, like, untitled Warner Brothers event film get replaced on the calendar with Tenet. <laughs> that's ten- Tenet, right? Tenet. 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 Yes, you're mm-hmm. right. That's not usually the type of title you see associated with a July blockbuster in 2020 an untitled event film exactly right godzilla tenant yeah which number of film is that for nolan 11 it's not his 10th film is it i feel like dunkirk was 10 am i wrong about that let's count them i think this is 11 i mean it's somewhere in that yeah zone, right like okay F- uh following, following the mento okay you're gonna do the count yeah it's counting it's 11 it's oh 11. Okay. dunkirk was 10 Great okay. tenth movie, perfect tenth movie. Yeah. I mean, really, kind of like the ultimate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And like, well, what is this? What is Black Hat for Man? Twelve. Is it? Is it that? I think. If we're not counting Jericho Mile, which, and I want your opinion on this. A lot of our European listeners have gotten angry. This is his eleventh movie. If wow! You don't count really? Jericho Mile. If you count Jericho Mile, it's it makes 12. It twelve. Okay, interesting. If you count L.A. Takedown, that makes it thirteen. You know, like this is right. obviously the sort of. The liminal yeah. space. I count Jericho Mile because I I love it. Sure, and it feels cinematic to me. And right. like I would love to see that movie on a big screen. The thing is, I don't count the keep because it sucks. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Get it out of there, <laughs> or lock it up. Keep it in there. I mean, yes. The argument with Jericho Mile, much like with Duel, yes. Spielberg's Duel is right. It did play in theaters, not in America, but in elsewhere. Europe. So that kind of makes it a movie, right. right? So a lot of our European listeners are saying you should take it seriously. By this point, we will have already released a Patreon episode covering Jericho Mile, which right. is our concession to that. But the thing for me is, I fall under what was the intent when it was produced. And Jericho Mile was produced as a television film. That's true. It was shot on film, and as was tradition back then, most American uh, TV films were released in theaters. There are a lot of examples of pilots being released in theaters. Sure. Uh, you know, two-hour pilots being released in theaters. I don't think that makes the Starsky and Hutch pilot a movie. I don't know. You know? Maybe it is. Who directed it? I don't know. I think Starsky and Hutch was released as a fucking movie in Europe. I though. believe you. If not that, I mean, many of those sorts of cop shows... And Bowser Galactica was a movie in Europe, but it wasn't here. There are uh, things right. like that. Um, no, well, that was back in the day when television was a newer thing. And, yeah. you know, maybe you have to go see a movie to see a thing. I don't fucking know. And I, it was, I this is not an argument I want no, to have. No. Uh, we haven't watched it yet. I have, like, no stakes in this. At the time we're recording, we haven't watched it Jericho yet. Jericho Mile is have, the only Michael Mann thing I've ever seen. We will have and, watched uh, it by the time I want to see it. It's out. really good. Yeah. It is I mean, really good. Yeah. I'm sorry. Dennehy? Is Brian Dennehy, Dennehy in it? I think Dennehy's in it. It's been a while since I've seen it. I think, I think so. I know it's out on Blu-ray. I'm thinking of buying the Blu-ray because otherwise you watch like a really shitty VHS yeah. right. YouTube cut. Get, it, get the blue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep, Dennehy's in there. Yes! Uh, we've got, and Peter Strauss is the, yeah, okay. the lead. And then of course, uh, past and future guest Richard Lawson. Is there an actor named Richard Lawson? Yeah, oh, you yeah. know that guy? Uh, he's, he's, no. he's one of those guys. He's been he's, he's, he's he's guy. an African-American oh, yes, actor. Uh, of, the director of Trolls. I don't think I know this guy. Six bits deep. Uh, You know, he's a... We're inceptioning bits here. uh, He's, yeah, he's just, he's a guy, right? How else would you describe him? He's He's a that guy. You're like, like, oh, yeah, sure, sure, I know that guy. I'm looking him up now. There's a poltergeist, Streets of Fire. Good movies. Good movies, too. Wow. Um, All right, but anyway, we're not talking about the Jericho. No, we're not, sorry. We're talking about Richard Lawson's IMDb page. Oh, right, we're talking about Black Hat. Um, But as you say, I'd love to... Uh, I'd love to see him make another movie. Like oh, yeah, I, I, I don't. I like this movie a lot. I don't want this to be his last movie. He's only seventy five. I think he's he can churn out some more. He can Ridley Scott it for a while, right? He's an active guy. You yeah. know, I mean, he's 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 a a serial developer of things, yeah. and eventually some of them happen and some of them don't. And you know, do you know better than like that's what it always like? 
He's someone who, right, he can sit on projects for a while. He doesn't make movies quickly, usually, although mm. sometimes he has sort of creative flurries. Yeah. But how, after six years, is this the movie that comes, like, that he actually <sighs> signed, like, green, like, this actually happened? There's six years between Yeah, Public, Public Enemies is 09. Wow. This is 15. I mean, wow. I guess it was meant for 14. It got yeah. sort of shunted to January. Right. But, uh, like, how is it, like, that you're like, you know what? Yeah, the hacker drama with Thor. Okay, I got a take on this. Well, he produces, too. No, I know he yeah, produces, yeah. of course, right. Like, why is this the one he settled on? Not that I disapprove exactly. I'm just sort of intrigued that the more prestige things we've heard him be attached to don't go. Like the Ferrari movie. Or yeah. Or whatever, you know, whatever. whatever. There's some more Oscar-y sounding things. I think to some degree, this is my conjecture. I think to some degree, in a weird way, he was able to disguise this to make it sound like it was a more commercial film. Sure. Because right. it was modern. You got Thor. You got a big sexy movie star. You got China. You know, the, you can the get the Chinese love computers. market. With That's the, the yeah. big thing is you have Legendary. Legendary is now being acquired by a Chinese company at the time that this movie's going into development. Mm -hmm. They're the sort of first big production company to really put an emphasis on, like, we have to make films that work in Asian markets. And I think he pitched them a movie that sounded like the math added up. When if you actually look at this movie, of course this movie didn't do well. It's insane it did as poorly as it did. Yeah. But of course this movie at a, a fucking $70 million budget or whatever it is is not right. going to perform at that level. He was also working on it for years. I right. mean, it, you know, I mean they, they shot it all around the world. And I, I mean I remember this thing being a movie on the horizon forever. Yeah. Um, they so, would always, you know. I feel like in interviews he would talk about like I'm just very interested in this world. This would be one of those things where he's like, Here's a profession. Here's a subculture. Here's a shifting landscape that I'm interested in. I'm just doing research and research and research, trying to figure out what the story is there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, I think, how he works, really. Yes. And, and, um, I also feel like this film actually kind of fits in this loose trilogy with Miami Vice and Public Enemies. I mean, there is this yeah. kind of look at how surveillance and technology has kind of infiltrated our lives. I mean, you could even look at those three movies as, I mean, the order would have to be reversed, but it's kind of a progression, right? I mean, you look at Public Enemies and it's about technology yeah. and surveillance and how they completely overwhelm, you know, th this, this like outlaw figure who's, you know, trying to, trying to get away from both the mob and the authorities. Yeah. And meanwhile, both sides are like, you know, rapidly changing and becoming much more the modern. The very nature right. of They're, crime is yeah. shifting around yeah. him. The right. definition yeah. of, right. Like yeah. digital crime versus analog crime, right? right? Like that's what Public Enemies is about for yeah. sure. That's what Miami Vice is right. about kind of. Yeah. This feels very of a piece with Miami Vice. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. But I mean, the thing for me is, I'll say, I think the context in which this movie plays the worst is the exact context we have created. I think <laughs> if you were watching this mm -hmm. at the end of watching 11 Michael Mann movies in quick succession... <laughs> largely in order, the movie plays worse than like when it came out in theaters and a lot of people dismissed it and I saw it and I was like, this is an interesting movie. This yeah. is a Michael Mann movie. There's a lot going on here. I'm comparing this to the other movies in the landscape right now. Yeah. <laughs> if you're watching it three weeks after you watch like the Collateral, right. I don't know how well the movie... You might be like, oh, weird. Huh. <laughs> this feels like, sloppier. This feels weird. And, and it also is like the whole thing. I think the thing that made everyone write this movie off in the lead up to its release, which is the ridiculous element that people just either can't get past or someone like me, I think is what makes the movie interesting is like, it's a hacker movie in which Thor plays the hacker and he's also the best fighter in the world. Right. And he's super fucking cool. Uh, a hundred percent. It's like a crazy Hong Kong movie in right. that way. Like it has that vibe, yeah. right? Uh -huh. um, There's an element of it being like, like a Stallone or like a Schwarzenegger yes. or a Cruise movie where it's like the whole movie has to be about how this guy's the best. Except it's a movie star whose persona is not that. He just is this perfect genetic His persona is not that set, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. he right, hasn't exactly. settled into his, like, I'm kind of funny, too, thing no. yet. Yeah. But Wait, he... what were you going to say? Well, no, I was going to say, oh. I mean, but, except that I, I remember at the time people said, oh, God, you know, this guy, you know, Chris Hemsworth doesn't look anything like a hacker. But I kept sure. thinking to myself... Well, but he could conceivably look like somebody who's been in jail for years right. and has been, like, working out. Yeah. Right? Right. Here's my other thing. What does a hacker look like? No, that's yeah. it. Right. Like, exactly. what, what are they supposed to look like? Get, get over it. I, I think we're still kind of married to this, like, definition of a hacker from, like, 30 years ago, which is why I almost exclusively auditioned to play hackers. So viewed through that <laughs> prism, 
But you know, it's imagine like, you but, were so black like, but, I'd be Grant Black. <laughs> but, but, what's, rule. but what's Stop ironic? A guy with a screwdriver. But what's ironic is that the movie actually contains that stereotype in the villain, who is right. this like slobby yeah, guy this, in a basement somewhere, right. poorly yeah. nobody, who, right. right? Like is just at home all the but time. But that's the point: is it's like being a, a, a hacker is equivalent now to like being a doctor. Like it used to be, right. there was one type of super sure, yeah. antisocial indoor neurotic who would be a hacker. Right. But now, like, a hacker could be one of 18 stereotypes. And I think the bigger thing is, Michael Mann is obviously obsessed with, like, these guys who are driven to power. Sure. Feeling some sort of rush, being able to do something well, do something that makes them feel in control of their own lives, of the universe, of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you go, like, what he's doing is he's recasting in a way that's actually uh, overdue the idea of a hacker being, like, a modern thief. And there's so many movies about bank heists and thieves that are incredibly handsome, attractive, buff movie stars. Yeah. Uh, when in real life, most thieves probably look like Jim Belushi. Right. You know? As they should. Right. Um, and so it, no one goes like, well, a real thief wouldn't look like George Clooney. That's impossible. You're, of course not. You're right. I mean, right. Because people have seen To Catch a Thief or whatever. It's like, one of those I mean, movies. Like the handsome yeah. right. it's, Most people don't look like George Clooney. Right, exactly. I mean, this is also right. right. That's, right. <laughs> That's right. I always, I, I'm just usually very opposed to what you're talking about. The sort of, like, this movie star's in a movie playing right. a character? Yeah. He's a movie star. No one looks like him. And it's like, yeah. this, he's a movie star. You just said it. He should be the star right. of the movie. That's I mean, how the rules work. The argument with Hemsworth is there's a little bit for him, and some of this is out of his control. Well, I mean, Hemsworth is like a tree trunk. Like, That's yeah, what I was going right, to say. Yeah. And it's also out of his control because he hit the map playing four. He hit the map playing, right. So he, everyone's Asgardian like, God. impression of him is like, oh, this like perfect golden god, like a literal golden god. There's a little bit of the Schwarzenegger thing or the rock thing where when he enters a room, you want people to be like, no one else thinks it's crazy this guy this? looks like this. <laughs> Someone call the media. Right, even a movie like this where he's relatively toned down, you expect that every scene is interrupted by a guy being like, hey, I'm a talent agent. Please take my car. <laughs> you should do commercials or something. Like someone needs to acknowledge. You're wearing the hell out of that undershirt. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But I do think we accept these things of like traditionally like unbelievably handsome, charismatic X Factor movie stars can play cops. And they can play robbers. Yes. And they can play all these other sort of badass, powerful types that Michael Mann is usually obsessed with. And the hacker is one that's still stuck in this sort of antiquated stereotype. Sure, sure. Yeah. And he's Absolutely. just like, no, the movie's about a world in which the power has shifted. Right. And now the type of guy that I'm interested in as a movie character wouldn't be robbing a bank. The thing he would do is learn how to code. Right. So I'm still going to make a movie about the same kind of guy. His skill is just going to be different. I mean, he he literally made a movie about how bank robbing became an essentially unprofitable activity. Right. Where it's like, that's that scene in, in Public Enemies. Right. Where Frank Nitti is like, I make what you steal in a day. Like, yeah. you know, every day. Like, what, right. what, what's the point of you anymore? Right. And this is just another classic Michael Manker. I mean, he even has the, like, I don't burn people line. Which is almost <laughs> exactly the same line that Al Pacino says in The Insider. Like, I don't burn people. Right. That It's like these guys of principle who also are kind of scoundrels. Right. Who are pissing everyone off. But who imagine trying if to be the Pacino had been the hacker. I mean, that's the thing. You go, like, in 1987, it probably would have been. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. But that's also a concession, too. In 2015, 2014, whatever, if he wants to make this movie, he needs to cast a superhero. Like, I know. That's the only way he's going to get his financing. But this is also one of the only, I feel like it's the only movie with none of his guys in it. John Ortiz. John Ortiz is the one exception, right? Yeah. Right. But you're kind of like, you're sort of looking for those man fellas, those right. faces. Bruce McGill. And, yeah. And I got, like, Hope McElhaney should be in every Yeah, Michael he Mann absolutely. Movie. Like, yeah. If there are more Michael Mann exactly. movies, you know he's right. There's be a new him. ensemble yeah. at his fingertips here. Viola like, Davis turns out to be a perfect Michael Mann company. Viola player. Davis, I mean, then she made Widows, which is right. basically like, um, you know, Michael Mann's spirit movie, right? <laughs> like, so this is a question for she's you. She's so suited to it. For you right off the bat, Bilga. Uh, I saw the theatrical when it came out in theaters. I saw the uh, director's cut, which is now streaming on FX. Yeah. And it's on the FX and now on the app. app. Yeah. But it says like this version has been modified. No, but that's that's just uh, airplane language. Now, right? I had you know also I mean? read that the director's cut when he played it at BAM was two hours 16. And this cut came in at like two nine. Hmm. So I feel like this definitely was the cut where it's rearranged. Where the the power plant happens halfway through or whatever, right. it was that sequencing 
But I was trying to figure out if scenes were missing or not. And there was a scene I was waiting for the whole movie that didn't happen. And I now am trying to figure out, did I create this scene in my mind, <laughs> which is very possible, or did I watch a cut of this movie that doesn't have the scene in it? I remember there being a scene where Viola Davis tells Chris Hemsworth a story about her husband. No, uh, she offhandedly mentions right. There's the something. right. There's that scene where, the me- where she mentions it. She mentions the whole McElhaney. Where he goes, who did you lose? And she says, my husband. Right. There's the scene with John Ortiz where she invokes 9-11 and she says, I yeah. lost people. You don't get to tell me. Yeah. What but, does she say to Hemsworth? I just maybe in my head blew it up to be a bigger moment. I don't remember her saying anything to Hemsworth. Right? Okay. I, I remember Those her, are the two mentions. She, right. she says it on the phone to John Ortiz. Yeah. Right? And they hear it. Right. Um, and then Holt McElhaney asks her about right. it later. It up. And in fact, the first time I saw the film, I... I missed that yeah. that initial uh, mention of it to John Ortiz so that later on it seemed to come out of the blue, which right. I actually thought was kind of interesting. I thought it was kind of yeah. cool where yeah. he's like, I know who you are. Like, yeah. I know right. what kind of a public servant you are. Yeah. Right. yeah. I just, I think I created this scene in my head because I even, the mental image was outside of uh, the airport where the car gets bombed, where Viola Davis gets killed. I remember the two of them standing outside there and her talking about her husband. Not in like some big emotional confessional way. I, I don't remember the I, but scene. I, I remember that as being I like, oh, that's Viola's this. Oscar this scene. Is, right. is, I invented it. S- yeah. Sergei Eisenstein is like applauding in his <laughs> grave right now. Like this is this is his like theory of montage right. just like personified. Right. Right. Because she's not even in that location at the point when that scene would happen. You're just like, shows up and you gets know what? Shot. I'm sure Viola would rock that scene. That's that's, I like. think honestly I was like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but no, that's not really Black Hat style anyway. No. Black Hat style is more offhand kind of like, yeah. 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 So I, my assumption is the reason they moved the power plant up to the cold open of the movie is because at some point the studios went, wait a second, the first act of this movie is just about soy futures? Right. It's, it, it must have been that they thought it was too slow a build, they right? Wanted- like we got to get some steaks, instant steaks here, and it can't just be that soy futures are expensive. They probably wanted a pop. And I yeah. wouldn't, uh, and I don't know that it would have been. Maybe man did too. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think man yeah. probably thought that way too. I will say, I mean, as much as I love this movie, and I've watched it, you know, I've watched both versions many times. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing that I do think, I, I do think that maybe there need there needed to be one more hack, like there because because <laughs> sure because in the director's the director's cut works much better. It does, but yeah. it is kind of like this this like soy futures hack or Chicago mm-hmm. you know, mercantile exchange hack. And then, like, all hell breaks loose and they're right. pulling people out of prison to, like, right. help them. And, it, you, like, it feels like something more urgent needs to happen mm-hmm. for this whole, you know, Hathaway to business to like, really work. It, it, desperate measures call for desperate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Offer him whatever he wants. Literally yes. the only guy in the world who can help us solve this is, like, in prison and we need to get him out and we don't have any time. Like, right. I'll, I'll so say, it makes yeah. sense for there to be, like, a, like a, a thing, reactor a explosion thing. or something. I, I do think that's, like, a weird example of the, like, Speaking of like Eisenstein and creating weird meaning through like yeah. edits and juxtapositions of things, mm-hmm. I think the theatrical version has more urgency to it. Sure. Because it starts with a catastrophic event. Even if the placement of that event doesn't make any sense, you kind right. of accept it as like an underlying tension to every scene yeah. that then weirdly isn't referenced until halfway through the movie. Well, and it's, it's <laughs> it, it, well, yeah, it, like weirdly, like they, 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 after all this other shit happens, right. they finally go to Start the like, site. Oh, and, it's like, there. And, right. Right. and it's like cuts to like the exact same shot of these guys running. It's like it's right. like literally 10 seconds I later. I remember in the theater being like, this is clearly what happened. Like before the story had even leaked out of like, oh, he reassembled the chronology. Right. Right. It was just like clearly this was not supposed to happen in this, this early story. in the movie. Yeah. Of course. But the other thing that happens is, yes, there is some urgency at the beginning when you put the reactor at the beginning. Yeah. But then the story kind of de-escalates. Yeah, which is, that's the right, whole which problem. Which is interesting. Like, because, yes. it, I mean, it goes from, I mean, it starts with a, like a oh, fucking shit. nuclear reactor. Get right. Hathaway. And, then, yes. and then it goes to, you know, soy futures. Right, right. And finally, it's like, he's cornering the market on tin? <laughs> yeah, like, you yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, I mean, it's right. I mean, that's the Michael Manning yeah, though. Right. I love it, where yeah. he's like, you, you don't understand. Soy is everything. Yeah. You yeah. know, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. My, my, I mean, like, I, that in the director's cut, that scene, which is not in the theatrical, but of the the ship trying to yes, yeah, right, know, yeah, that yeah, weird scene of the, the at the port of really good scene. right, great Captain scene, too. but like right. the most yeah. Michael Mann thing you can imagine yeah. because yeah. it's like, you know, 
the ship can't dock. Not right. because there's anything wrong with the ship. No. Insurance. Right? right? It's like th- th- their cargo's value has increased, so they don't have the requisite amount of yes. insurance right. to dock. It's like that is the most Michael Mann thing you can imagine. And also that's – you see in that scene in a nutshell why Michael Mann wanted to make a movie about cybercrime because <laughs> it's like so weird that someone can do something on a remote laptop in two seconds. That jeopardizes a boat currently in motion, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that like immediately the ripple effect of that. Right. While yeah. disconnected is so strong that a boat just stops. But right. And I, I like all that. And that yeah. notion that like our relationship with China is so fraught in the cybersecurity sector, but so important in the trade sector. Yeah. And like that it's all getting flipped around. But yeah, that's some that's some dad reading an economist article, yeah. you know, level <laughs> yeah. of tension. Can you believe? And then they stopped the boat. <laughs> right. Like I don't see like universal execs right. being like, hold up a second. The insurance? Oh my, this is we right. gotta rush this to production. <laughs> yeah, like but as as you say, Belga, it doesn't feel to me like it's a studio mandated thing. I would just as soon believe that man came to that decision right. himself because oh, he's yeah. like, Oh fuck, I want to be more exciting. Yeah. Yeah. But it does feel like a kind of panicked thing of like can you have the movie start with something that feels this much out of the Wall Street Journal? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. at this budget level, sold yeah. as an action movie. It's like, a, you know, I, I kind of want my ideal hybrid version of this movie to be like, there's the reactor explosion at the beginning, and then it ha- happens again. Yeah, then, <laughs> right. Right. I don't know what the escalation of that is, but that, exactly. Yeah. Then he like, fires <laughs> a nuke. I don't know. Well, that's What's it- a cool hacker thing to do that's this other thing i think he's exploring in this is like so i understand now the people who know how to work uh, computers are more powerful than any people have ever been right Right, the amount you can the more we connect everything to computers the more we empower them. if you speak that language those who are the most fluent have a greater capacity to affect the entire world in a moment than anyone ever has especially if they're black hats which are like hackers who are like i just want to sow chaos and like be bad right But his thing is like, how do I make this visually exciting? Like, how do I make an action film out of a thing that in terms of the physical action is pretty fucking boring? And I think he's experimenting so much with like, how do you construct the story around it so that it has consequence? How do you make the, you know, foot chases around the hackings, Mm -hmm. you know, ticking clocks on the hacking? And then also all the weird shit he's doing with like, how am I going to shoot this? Yeah, let's oh, yeah. let's let's and, have and lines whole, moving through yeah. wires. Yeah, and the whole thing feels to me like a visual exercise, right? Yes. Because yes. I mean, every other shot in the film has some sort of grid in it. Even if yes. like, I mean, even if it's not a grid, it's like everything is patterned in that way. Yeah, and even the way Hathaway moves through space is right. like, like early on in the prison, you see him through the bars as they're carrying him, but then like that echoes later. When the scene with the in, in Indonesia in the parade where he's like slowly making his way mm-hmm. towards um towards right, Kassar. through these yeah, lines yeah. of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it's like finally he's like he finally has some agency and he's able to move through this world finally. You know, right? And Michael Mann's a city he's guy. He's ghost man. He's ghost he's man. Ghost man. Yeah, he's ghost manning around. Michael Mann's a city guy, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and obviously, one of his most recurring. Uh, he loves his his nighttime cityscape, seeing the grid of a city and the lights yeah. at a distance where you can't see the individual people or the cars, but you understand the way that the city is bustling. And when I saw this in theaters and the first time it goes inside the computer, I was like, oh, fuck. Is I he messing it. this up? Like, is he, like, trying to be, like, computers are exciting? Because there's so many, like, swordfish-esque movies sure. in which they, like, speed ramp through the circuit board. Yeah. And you're like, okay, this is too performative. But the thing he does is... He stays in these things for a long time, and they the longer you're inside a computer, you're looking at a circuit board, you're looking at the wires, you're looking at the literal internet or whatever he's sort of showing you, yeah. the more cold and desolate it becomes, and the more you start paying attention to the weird patterns oh, yeah, and yeah. the grids and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And it's like, for him, it's just another city. Yeah, yeah. You know? 100%. Absolutely. And it's like, if he did one really fast 15-second thing, I'd be, be like, like roll eyes. Grandpa's trying this? to show us the internet. He gets the internet. <laughs> Series of tubes. Right, but when it lasts for, like, 85 seconds, yeah. you're like, this scares him. Oh, yeah. And then there's a there's one moment where, it, like, the action of, like, what's happening on the... It, like, slows down. Yes. And there's, like, almost like a... I can't remember if it's, like, almost a close-up on a on one of the other... One of the lights in the corner, as if, like, we're supposed to know what that means. Right. Yes. He likes the uh, um, what's the, the the dramatic flashing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Like oh oh, I see. Like 
This that, is all it takes. That is crazy. Right. That yes, it's of course like it's crazy. A single light going off. We like should a microscopic blow up the internet. light in a box. Get rid of it. Right. Can like destroy everything in a moment. Um, because he's, he, this is about like this, there was a real program that like disrupted the Iranian nuclear mm-hmm. program so incredibly, mm-hmm. even though it was secret, I think. Yeah. Like that's what he's initially inspired by that like. There were these cyber attacks that right. basically just like shut down whole reactors that we didn't yeah. even know about. Sure, because yeah. unlike attacks of of physical violence, which end up on the news, it's these things are just sort of like, silent. What the fuck? Right? What, what fucking hell? Like you know, it's just that right. it's yeah. us calling Verizon and being like, I-, I can't, I can't watch Succession on HBO. And the amount of time in the first chunk of this movie that is devoted to Christian Borle, right? Mm-hmm. Who is like one of Broadway's best like musical comedy actors? Absolutely, playing like a guy at an office who's like, I didn't let anyone use my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Why is everyone on my case? And they're like, Are you sure? And he's like, Yeah, I'm sure. Right. Well, except for that one guy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that's the thing; it feels so like that couldn't actually cause anything bad to happen. This is a movie where like a phishing attack. Is like a pivotal second act action sequence, right? right? right. William Mapother succumbing right. to a fishing attack. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? What else? There's another thing. Well, right, and then the 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 USB, the, right? Um, oh yeah, the Telltale USB, yeah, the hotel lobby, yeah. Any of those things. It's like, uh, but like, there's movies like Entrapment that are the same fucking thing, but they suck, right? I like. I'm, you're right. There's a. It's very hard to uh, make this feel like it has any stakes. Well, right. he's he's not interested in the things that make – like those movies try to make this stuff sexy by, was, exactly. by actually they, sexing yeah, it up. They always default to like what if someone ha- had sex basically like while this was happening. Yeah. Right. Like that's the swordfish move. That's the entrapment move. Like, right. Can yeah. we like literally just have naked bodies like right there? Is right. that a way yeah. to make this spicier? Right. And, um, and, and, in, and but, but in man's case, it's like no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to make it sexy by just like – Showing you how a, a circuit board is like a cityscape at night, which like which like the the man fans yeah. like us We're are like, just like oh my god oh yeah. my god that is totally sexy <laughs> and the regal court street that I saw this oh it's empty oh no right. it's here right. Right. Yeah. no and and the guy is sexy and the lady is sexy Absolutely. and they have sexy right. sex sure. once they've finished hacking they right. put their computers well, away they have that classic uh, man sex though where you're sort of like squinting at the frame right. for a second you're like is this one body or two yeah. okay oh I see you know but, like, but you he know. doesn't you know he doesn't click her boobs. There isn't a scene where she's getting off on how well he hacks. Like, sure. I think that's a thing in all the sort of 90s, early 2000s yeah. cybercrime movies we're talking about where it's like the woman starts to, like, get off when the guy is coding really fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and they're like, this guy doesn't code like other people. He's like a rebel coder. Absolutely. You know? They're trying to, this isn't your granddaddy's computer program. Right. And this know. movie is just like, no, they're like professionals. And it's like, You math. know that Hugh Jackman isn't your granddaddy's computer coder because right. he lives in an Airstream trailer and plays golf. Off the roof. Remember that? In yeah, that movie's crazy. That movie that is movie's actually is insane. Yeah. Terrible. It's yes. truly bad, but it it's one of those movies where you watch it and you're like, oh, this has a little more uh, deeper roots in the culture than I thought it would at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, there's a lot of movies like this. Oh, yeah. Uh, and obviously, it's a derivative movie itself, right. but it's, it is it is insane. Who, Dominic Senna? Is that a Dominic it's Senna? It's a Dominic Senna. Yeah. What's he up to now? I think he did Season of the Witch. Did he not? My beloved Season of the Witch. <laughs> Your beloved <laughs> Good Bill, movie. have you? It this is movie. a good movie. I right? like Season of the Witch. Thank you. I like Season of the Witch. I bring it up all the time. People yep, think I'm like his last sort one. of reclaiming as a trash masterpiece. I think that's actually a really good functional. You know, genre I really movie. enjoyed it. He's yeah, a really. musical video Claire director. Foy, great in that movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. Her breakup. Um, but uh, <laughs> her best right. performance. His five <laughs> the movies. The titular witch. <laughs> the titular witch. <laughs> I've already spoiled the twist on this podcast. Right, that she is Satan. Right. I think that's such a brilliant twist. Is like the whole movie is like, is she a witch or not? Do witches exist? And like. No, the witch thing was a like Canarchy Satan. <laughs> Witches. She, you wish she was a witch. He made California, Gone in 60 right. Seconds, Swordfish, Whiteout, Season of the Witch. It's five and out for Rem- Dominic. Remind mm-hmm. me how you spell California? Uh, with a K. Oh, very cool. At least it's not with a backwards K. Yeah. That would be the, the doubling, you know. Like, yes. Right. A hat on like, a hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when the trailer goes like. <laughs> so, you know, it's extra twisted. Yeah. No, but I, I think there. I view this movie, the weird movie I, I view this as a sister piece to is uh, Night of Cups. Uh, sure. Another fine film. Yep. Uh, the, 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 my favorite of the, the three Malick sort of, you no know. No question. Personal yes. you know, plot light sort of 
uh, what what is it to be a person movies. Right. <laughs> and in both cases... I don't know how, to describe, how would you describe? People call them the twirly movies or whatever, but I don't know what the I word the is. the twirlies are good. I, I think Bill is making a face. He doesn't no, no, I, no okay. that, I wouldn't call them the twirly movies. <laughs> a lot of twirling, that's all. First like of all, the there's twirling. twirling in the other movies. There is, too. I know, he's twirl heavy. Twirling's all right. How, but how would you, whatever those three movies are. You know, I, I always want to call them the autobiography. I was about, uh, autobiography. Right. They're all about trilogy, some part of his like, life. Like Tree of Life is also autobiography. So yeah, it's Tree of like Life is the sort of tetralogy. Right. It's sort of like well, one foot in each uh, yeah. world. See, him, my thing is, I movement. what I view those three films as are, I'm going to make three movies trying to explain and explore why I didn't make a movie for 20 years. Right. Yeah. Like the, the whole mythology of right, right, Terrence right. Malick that was like, why did he disappear? All these right. contrasting did stories. He yeah. Did he have a total mental breakdown? Was he like above the industry? Was he below the industry? Like all three of those movies are like, uh, I mean, To the Wonder is the relationship that he had during right. those wilderness years. And Knight of Cups is like how he felt like a fucking phony sure. when he was at his the peak of his success. Yeah, it's his Barton Fink. Right. And then Song to Song is like his, like, the industry is evil movie. Sure. Right. And also, I think, I think Song to Song is, uh, is also about how Austin has changed. Right. Yes. Um, yes. Which it's I don't a, know much of. I, I don't, right. I, this is actually something I've heard from other people who are like, that actually, sense, that, that film, for people in Austin, mm -hmm. who I guess are, uh, you know, in tune with Malik movies, mm -hmm. uh, that film actually has a lot of, you know, very personal resonance apparently they're interesting movies i think nice cups them. is the best i agree and i think nice cups was the one that people laughed off the most because they were like this feels like self-parody well also and, like dan Harmon's in it. i think people were just baffled by it but they were like what do i is like, i agree the, i like it's, it. it's, it's the one with least narrative correct yes you know. no pretty much no narrative right, right. yeah but it's bro broken into the relationships yeah. And the key to the movie is all the weird, like, why is Joe Latrulio in this? Why is Dan right. Harmon in this? Why are there so many comedy writers and sketch performers? And apparently he, like, encouraged them to do long improv riffs on set, explicitly trying to be funny. Right. I made this comment on the podcast, and someone who had worked on that movie said, like, you're totally right. When we were filming it, I mean, when we were filming it, when it was being filmed, I was working on the movie. He very much was describing this to people as a comedy. Right. It's like... How can a guy who's this successful is literally having like a guy come up to him with an envelope of $2 million and be like, it's a shitty script. Just do a rewrite two days. Right. And then goes like, nature, how you burn inside of me. You know, like what, what the fuck is this thing? He can't help himself. In the same way where it's like, why is Thor playing a computer hacker who still acts like a Michael Mann character? Like, is this self-parody? But I think both are, in addition to, you know, whatever the personal things are for them. Like, I think this movie is Michael Mann trying to figure out how much the world that he's been interested in his entire career has morphed, you know? I think part of it is also that he's trying to, like, the movie itself is, I think, struggling to find a kind of language to describe what's happening yeah. on screen, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, is, for example, there, you know, there'll, there'll be a couple of scenes where somebody just, like, hits a button very casually and something horrible happens. Mm -hmm. right. But then there'll be other scenes where, you know, there'll be like a close up of a computer button and it's like the sound is like a gunshot. And it's like, is this thing really, is, is the important thing here that it's really significant or right. the right. is the important thing here that it's totally insignificant? Right. And it's like the movie actually keeps like changing in that way. Um, so you get the sense that like everything is constantly in flux visually, even sonically in the film. And I think that actually reflects kind of the whole idea of cybercrime and living in this world where technology rules everything. Right. And it, that these crimes can feel victimless or like you, you yeah. maybe have no concept, human concept yeah. of, of the chaos you're wreaking. Public Enemies has that too. Like, yeah. right? I mean, like the very form of the movie changes as it progresses. Like it yeah. starts off looking kind of very filmy and by the end it's very video-y. But, like, the whole movie is about, like, the encroachment of technology. Absolutely. So, like, the form right. of the film actually bears out the themes of the film, which right. I think is, you know, fascinating. Right. But the film also boils down to him having a face-to-face -face meeting with a guy using entirely rudimentary oh, yeah, yeah. objects. Right. You know? They, in the middle of an ancient, like, traditional ceremony. Right. Yeah. And the guy even says something. Oh, no. I mean, Hathaway actually says, like, he has a line. It's like, no codes, no keyboards, no, no yeah, screen. He like, there's his, a, where yeah. he's suddenly yelling a manifesto in the middle of this yeah, festival yeah, right. where they're about to stab each other. And, and, um, no ones and zeros. No ones yes, and zeros, right. right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then the other guy says something like, uh, 
you know, I have other people do sub symbolic stuff for me, <laughs> which like that is also such a like only Michael Mann would ever have yes. the villain in like the climactic scene use the expression sub symbolic, mm-hmm. <laughs> like whatever the fuck that means. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, it's a fair point. Meaning like human interaction, I think I is what he means. Yeah. I don't know. Also, the villain doesn't show up basically until the last 20 minutes of the Correct. movie. Like you'll cut to him sort of just like, you know, shambling right. around and like hitting some buttons in a basement. But they're both just kind of chaos people, yeah. right? I mean, they're both people who are kind of addicted to how much power they can now hold because of their mastery of this technology. Right. I mean, there is this thing that we're sort of talking around, which is that, like, uh, I, I feel like uh, technology has advanced faster than our understanding of how it has changed storytelling has been able to sort of, like, uh, uh, I don't know, crystallize, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, like just the amount of I, I, it's like a hacky fucking thing, but everyone says this all the time. Where you like watch movies from fifteen twenty years ago, and you're like, this plot wouldn't exist if this character had a cell phone. Oh, right. yeah. You know, there's so many films like that where it's just like if this technology existed, if they had access to this, if they were able to locate this person. You know, like After Hours is a movie that doesn't exist, mm-hmm. and even if the plot is his cell phone falls out the window along with <laughs> his wallet. It's still easier for him to sort of recobble what he needs to get home. Yeah, of course. Right. He can just like log into some shit. Right. There are just like a ton of, of things he could do. Yeah. Um, and and it, it also, I, I think it's a bigger thing is how it's affected visual storytelling. You know, I think it's fucked with uh, film and TV more than anything mm-hmm. because these powerful movements aren't exciting looking. Right. You know, someone mm-hmm. having a fight with their girlfriend over text is not very cinematic. No. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work on stage. It no. doesn't work on screen. You can true. write it as a book in text, you know? You Even can... that's kind of boring. Yeah, but It makes still. me think of the Twitter joke. I feel like I've seen a few people say this where um, it's like they're, they, they are texting or writing, I'm screaming, and literally in that moment, they're sitting there <laughs> right. like with a blank <laughs> st- yeah. like stare on their face. Right. <laughs> Right, but the way the I culture... don't actually laugh out loud, guys. Right? What? No, I'm sorry. This whole time, I'm not uh, laughing my ass. I off. thought he was giggling his butt off. <laughs> I thought he was slapping, slapping what's his. Uh, what's this? His hoping side. for some, at least yeah. a couple yeah. chucks. Right. If I stop thinking Knee about slapper. you, if I stop thinking about anything, it disappears. Is the lineup? Uh, yeah. I remember. Yeah. Right. David. Yeah. I'm doing it. Okay. I'm hitting the alarm. Red alert. <laughs> Oh, what a lovely uh, noise. Uh, uh, All right. I got to talk about camp. Okay, let's talk about I gotta camp. I got to talk summer about camp. summer camp. I yes, know people teenage don't like experience it. at summer camp. It's fine. It's I've fine. hit the alarm. Yeah, sometimes you just got to talk about it. Wait, so he sounded the camp alarm? Yeah. yeah. Ugh, really? Sorry. What? what why? Right, just it's fine. It's just the... You know, I was alerted to the fact that you're talking about camp. Listenership so I was supposed to come in here with the blowtorch and put you on fire. Just give me a second because okay, I'm right. I'm gonna I'm gonna what make you it worth a while. What do you want to say? No, just he's hold got on the for blowtorch. Some. He's trying to crisp. What me. do you want to say? Barbecue you. I have a lot of VHSs from summer camp. You do. You were you went to this arty summer camp for performers, right? And they would gouge the kids by uh, uh, charging to get VHSs at the performances. Sure. So I got all my skits and my scattles. Mm-hmm. The routines, yeah. the early days of my comedy right, career. Griffin Newman origins. I'm telling you from the last time. <laughs> uh huh. You one including this is something crazy. I don't know if I ever told you guys. Did a bit at Camp Talent Show when I was 13 years old. That was me doing a comedy routine with a tick doll. Oh, wait. I think you. Mm. It was a plush Patrick Warburton tick yeah. with a voice box, and I did a routine where it was like it was my ventriloquist dummy, and I would hold it up to the microphone, and I would talk to it. How crazy is that? That's crazy. And people go, that's crazy. How can I see this? And I go, you can't, because it's on some VHS. Bleep it out. I need to swear. Because I was getting passionate. All right. Keep it in, but bleep it out so the so our, our right, sponsor right. knows that I care about this issue. Because what I can do is I cannot digitize these things. Yes, you can go to Legacy Box. So they're watchable. Yes. You can go to Legacy Box, which is a very special company very that special. can take your your films, mm-hmm. photos, yeah. any kind of archival material that's not digital, right? Yeah. Like, so VHSs, right? Uh, I don't know, film reels, things like that. You can put them in a box. Photos. You don't have to do anything hard. Yeah. Like, it's not like you have to 
separate. You just put you throw them in a cardboard box that they send you. David, it's yeah, a nice okay. cardboard. I thought box. you were going to skip over the most important part, which is they send you the box. They send you a box. You don't got to go box hunting. No, you don't got to go box stepping around your neighborhood. They send you a box. Let me tell you, it's a good box. It's a it's a very sturdy box. I say cardboard because boxes are made out of cardboard, but like it's a sturdy box. It's a good card stock. It's got a good <laughs> micron. Yes, it does. Of thickness and not too thick, not too thin. You send it. They do the rest. They professionally digitize all your moments into a thumb drive or a digital download or a DVD, whatever you want. Take it back. They have safety barcodes included for every single item. You're going to get everything, all the original stuff you send in back with perfectly preserved digital copies. And you can get personal, personal updates at every step up to 12 personalized email updates as they you know, turn it into digital. You're getting emotional I am talking getting, about I'm getting how good the service is. You're getting a over, little choked up. Over 450,000 families have trusted them with their memories. Yeah. They have a decade of experience. All the work is done by hand right here in the USA. And genuinely, I would not know what to do with something like what you're talking about, like the trove of VHS tapes, right. home movies. Like when I was a kid, me and my cousins used to make fake commercials. Mm. Uh, like, you know, on, on like my uncle's like camcorder. Yeah, you know, I did like that with once. It was edits. called Booger King. <laughs> Like edits in camera, like we would Get just it. turn it off and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, you know, how do you? How, it's impossible to preserve. Throw them in the box. All right. So there's never been a better time to digitally preserve your memories. Played you can it for my visit. They were like, "Why are we watching this?" You can visit <laughs> legacybox.com today, <laughs> Griff. I'm calling to action. Okay. There's never been a better time to digitally preserve your memories. Yeah. Visit legacybox.com today to get started. Plus, yeah. For a limited time, they're offering our listeners an exclusive discount. Go to LegacyBox.com slash check and get 40% off your first order. Now, David, I got to admit, I stopped paying attention for a little bit there when you were talking. Did you mention the fact that they send you back your original stuff? Yes, I mentioned that. that's a big thing I, I love. I mentioned that. You're not going to lose it. You're not losing they don't, like, the beauty of the physical They don't like it up and throw it in the garbage. They, they don't do it. back with individualized barcodes. All. So they're very practical about it. Now, Ben, are you willing to put away the blowtorch? Because I used... A <clears throat> camp story to give personal experience for the ad read. Is that allowed? David, I'll give you the final say. It was in the name of a greater good. It was terrific. Put the blowtorch away. Go okay. And go to legacybox.com slash check to save 40%. How about today. that? It's conditional. Ben will put the blowtorch away if you go to Legacy Box. Legacybox.com slash check. You can save 40%. Get started preserving your past. Um, there is a thing, though, that, like, technology has made us uh, a somewhat sociopathic in how divorced our emotions are from what we're actually doing mm -hmm. because they're disconnected because they're remote and satellite and all that sort of shit. Uh, and the nature of storytelling is, like, show, don't tell. And the nature of technology is a lot of telling things. <laughs> I mean, even, like, coding and hacking is, like, typing commands into a computer. Yeah. Being like, do this. Yeah. Which the soy futures thing manifests as just a guy being like, boat's done. But you understand why they're like, we only have one like explosion in the movie in this yeah. way, you know? And it's and it's a realistic explosion too. Oh yeah. yeah. Like right. you don't see a power plant go kaboom. Right. You see it like melt down and like one part of it explodes. Right. It's very realistic. But then like when a, you know, they they blow up a car. You're like, this is weird. That these hackers are just like <laughs> blowing up cars. with you know a bazooka, saying? right? That but they're like showing up in a place with a bazooka. But, but, but like, but th this is also such a Michael Mann thing, with, where like, there's this whole section of the movie where they, the, you know, the bad guy gets on a boat, on a motorboat, goes out to a ship, gets the bazooka, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. goes back to shore, yeah. just so we can later have the scene where he blows up this car with. A, I mean, and uh, I guess that would make sense also because. Otherwise, we'd be like, how the hell did this guy suddenly get a bazooka? Right. But it's such a weird little thing. Like, he has to explain how he gets this it, thing. It's a scene yeah. that when you're watching the movie for the first time, you're like, there's I, there's no way I'm going to retain this. Like, right. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going <laughs> you're on. You're already throwing way exactly. too much at me. Right. Um, Black hat. But yeah, but then there is a cool bazooka scene. Mm -hmm. Holt McElhaney gets shot so hard that he sort of like flies like a rag doll. Which you know that they researched. I mean, I, I'm sure, sure they right. did. Because sure. like, yeah. he... He's very particular about making sure that, like, when someone gets shot, they get shot the way that, the like, it would happen in real life. Yeah. Here's a question I have. Is Chris Hemsworth doing Michael Mann? Is that the voice he's doing? On my third rewatch, having now, I've been listening to a bunch of commentaries, <laughs> yeah. too. Like, he's doing a Chicago he is. guy. He, he right? is, yeah. 
Well, he's from the character's supposed to be from Chicago. Which is hilarious. It is like it's so Michael Mann. Yeah, where they're like, it's the Chicago mercantile, and you're like, okay, all right. And and a lot of lead actors are playing their directors. Oh yeah, sure. That's a big thing when you spend. If you're the lead actor, spending a lot of time with the director, and you're trying to piece it together, and the director is the one who's explaining, this is what I think the story is about. This is the one. But I just I feel like people ragged on Hemsworth that Hemsworth's accent in this movie. I think it's very good. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Yeah, I think he's good. I think he's good I, in the movie. I, I think he's good in the movie I, I too. I think they're yeah. misplacing what I- is jarring about him being in the film. Sure, it's not right. his accent. It's that he's Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> it's that he doesn't sure. seem like a human being ever. You know, he's better than us. It is fun. I mean, Michael Mann's such a movie star guy. Like he really relies on those guys oh, yeah. to like sell yeah. all the things we've been talking about in a like commercial and fun way and also to get his movies made and to get his movies made of course that's his greatest superpowers these guys want to be in his movies and hemsworth is a movie star yeah like there's no i'm not disputing that Mm -hmm. but especially at this time because i think the moby dick movie is maybe comes in between the two ron howards i want to say yeah he's great in rush in the heart of the sea is a bit of a nothing and the heart of the sea comes after this right i think you're right but they're both kind of delayed they were both much delayed uh, and it was that so and I think and it's certainly it's like pre Ragnarok like it's right. pre Thor being fun right I, I think Thor is fun to be clear but you know, the Same commercial here, but, perception right, of Thor right, is right. fun um, and so I think there was that atmosphere especially like in among like deadline type writers of like Chris Hemsworth can he open a movie like and also do people are, care yeah, about it, Chris Hemsworth actually, it, it, Chris it's Hemsworth when he wasn't really cool like yeah, he wasn't he was exactly not, cool like he's very cool now there was yeah. a resentment towards him as if he were like a Sam Worthington where it's like are they forcing right. you, us to view this guy as a movie exactly. star exactly like do you deserve to be in the Michael Mann movie yet Chris well, like, we'll accept uh, yeah. Thor but like don't tell us we have to buy Hemsworth and it was that weird thing of like you know he's done a couple tiny things then he gets Thor right Yeah. and it's like a big deal that he's like the only like totally unknown actor to get one of these movies Yeah. and that everyone else who had been in the running for Thor was someone of some some sort of recognition right, right? right. but so it was like a big announcement of like Marvel's betting big on this guy who just got off the plane right and then he does his kind of like Heart of the Sea Rush Black Hat it feels like him doing a classic like I want to show that I really want to be a serious movie star and I want to be able to do like the DiCaprio Damon thing where I like go to real serious directors mm-hmm. and make adult films that can only get financed because I'm putting my name on them. Right. And the problem is that all of those films underperform. Well, because because that age is over. It's done. That's the thing. It's like Tom Cruise pulled that off back in the day and, and kind of established the model. Yes. And now – those kinds of films, I mean, they, they might get made occasionally, but they don't do well. I'd say Bradley Cooper's the closest to being able to pull that off yeah. in that sort of way. They're the guys who are still running off of that, like DiCaprio, mm-hmm. which is just because they've had a really good track record, 20 years of maintaining a sort of standard Hit. quality. Sure. Hit. Some of those people who are able to do that. But most of those guys spend, uh, especially now, spend a lot longer going through the motions of building up your international numbers before you then yeah. start flexing the muscle. And it's like he extended his movie star status too wide too early. And then I feel like it's so telling that now he's just like just a franchise guy. You know? It's he is true. so much a franchise guy. Well, you're forgetting 12 strong, though. I, we're 12 hey, strong. You know what? You are very correct. <laughs> I completely forgot that 12 strong, the untold story of the horse soldiers <laughs> existed. That's correct. Came out last year. Yeah. It premiered at Jazz at Lincoln Center. I forgot that. <laughs> Did you forget that it premiered at Jazz at Lincoln Center? Where do I remember that? I remember the evening. I just couldn't remember what was on the screen. <laughs> you were there, of course. I was there, of course. Every night you're there at Jazz at Lincoln Center. Always. Um, I'm hoping Damon Wayans is going to get up. And then, you know, because, yeah, his 2018 was 12 Strong, 12, 12 uh-huh. Strong, Infinity War, mm-hmm. and Bad Times of the El Royale. Right. Which was sort of him doing a favor to yeah. his buddy Drew Goddard, mm-hmm. right? Uh, this year he's got Endgame, mm-hmm. Men in Black International, which looks like a piece of shit. But who knows? Who knows? I don't know. At this point, it probably has already won Best Picture. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it has come out in presidents. theaters, and they had just gone. Uh, forget the rest of the year. Um, it's the new Green Book. <laughs> it just, it just. I, I know Men in Black is a completely sort of forgotten franchise that is like I, that you and I love. That a I lot know, of Bill our friendship is based around. Do you not love Men in Black? I. 
I said that the first one was a masterpiece, it. and Bilgo was like, Barry Sonnenfeld has never directed no, no, the, a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. It was just like the, the words masterpiece and <laughs> Men in Black should never, ever, ever. <laughs> He's directed he four Stone Cold masterpieces. Oh, my God. Masterpiece. What? What, Wait, what's the, even I'm what is the happening right now? <laughs> I would say there are at least three The first in Adams arguable. is not a masterpiece. Okay, so then I'll say three. Okay. Values get shorty. Oh, yeah, get shorty's good. So, I would not call that a masterpiece. I love get shorty. I think it's a perfect great, movie. Great movie. I think... And nine uh, lives. Looks, I think three stars is his gun. is his ceiling. You think he's a three star general? I think he is a three star <laughs> ceiling guy. Wow. I think. I mean, as I've said, like the story of Sonnenfeld is crazy, where he basically is a incredibly reliable, like fun '90s movie director. He yep. makes Wild Wild West, and like I guess Satan just came for whatever bar. Like that was it. He claimed his soul with that day because he's never made anything remotely good since. Look. Man in Black is one of those objects that I'm obsessed with, as I you are, we, and we I feel like it holds a lot of the same power as, like, Ghostbusters, where it's, like, when you've mm. seen the 10 years, 20 years of movies following it, failing to replicate that, you go, like, how did everything go right on this movie? And so it's one of those movies where any time I have any opportunity to talk to anyone who was involved in that first movie, I pump them for stories, and I always try to get the sense of, like, what happened to Sonnenfeld, and everyone's answer is, like, I don't know, he just... uh stop being good uh-huh. like there was no thing right. you know and it kind of falls into like i it's mean like rob reiner this helps sure another, that's another one where it's like there's almost just a line you draw and you're like before pretty good most of the right. but after i mean, bad. I mean rob reiner has one of the great track records in cinema history and then it I just did, like the falls off a clip but clip. it's one of those things where well, you he's go, like, like a surefire hit before and a surefire worst movie of the year after like right. that's how good it is like yeah. that's right. how consistent he is in both directions right but but he's major like he's making sure. major moves he's not uh, releasing four movies in the last year starring woody harrelson that no one knows about he's done like four I woody know, he harrelson. keeps making a movie about like a new york times article he read like <laughs> yeah. he keeps doing that where he's like can you believe it and, like someone links to something on facebook and then he immediately <laughs> <in light. laughs> He's got that Castle Rock money. He's, He's got that life. Castle Rock money. No, but it, it, some of those guys, it's weird because it's not like they're like idiot savants, but it's like there's a period of time where they're just in the pocket and every instinct they have is correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they're not in the pocket anymore and they're still operating solely off of instinct. Right. And their instincts yeah. are just wrong now. But I think it's also they're not getting the script that sure. they used to. I mean, that's part of it's that with those guys. I mean, with a guy like Mann, it's obviously different because he, yeah. you know, generally initiates his scripts. Or, yeah, he's not the credited writer on this one. I don't no. know the guy it's who's... One but, but I assume yeah. Mann had a lot of input I think on this so. script. I mean, the, the guy credited on it actually was like... Uh, no, like he worked on Queer Eye or something like that. Yeah, yeah. he was like an assistant editor on Click. Wow. Yeah. Like, and Rescue Me. Like, he, this is his only script. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's a pretty young writer. Right. Uh, it's four years did he old. Do something else? <laughs> was there something else like that he, he did? He kind after? of looks yeah. like Griffin Newman. Like, uh-huh. you know, like he you know does. I, mean? I could play him. But yeah, I gather right. that he and Man and kind grunt? of work together. Sure. I, I'm not sure. I don't that makes sense. I, I, mean, I think I read like an interview with him or something like that where, you know, like I think Man kind of guided it, although the script might have existed beforehand. I'm not sure. Right. Because there's, I mean, I think of Man and Ridley Scott in similar way. And they're, I think they're obviously pals. Um, but, uh, like the Ridley Scott method of screenwriting where he like yells at you in a room while smoking a cigar about everything that's going to happen in the movie. He just doesn't have the time to actually write it. Mm-hmm. He's just like, and then uh, the prim- the alien's going to, yeah. you know, like he just sort of talks like that for a while. You hire but, someone to write the movie so that you can sit back and yeah. rewrite it. But, 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 but man yeah. was, a like, man started off as a writer. Yeah, so man is yes, more of a like, real writer. Yeah, writing like, is kind of in his DNA in absolutely. that sense. I feel like, I mean, we were talking about that right when, was it when The Keep came out? There's that old interview you were talking about where he's like, I have this script called Heat. Yeah. I can't direct it, but I'd love someone yeah, He's to like, I think it's the, it. best, like, script it's the best script I've ever I've written. Right. I, I don't think I could ever pull it off Like, as he didn't a even think of himself as, like, worthy yeah. of trying that shit. Right. Yeah. You've met Michael Mann. I have met We gotta Michael. talk about him. We gotta talk Bilga knows Michael I know. Mann. He's yeah, best Michael friends Mann. with yeah, Michael exactly. Mann. My, my buddy, Michael Mann. You summer with Michael Mann. Right? <laughs> Cape Cod. <laughs> That's fucking beach. Michael Mann does not summer. I, I don't about burn. To say. I don't burn people. I get sunburnt. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine like Michael Mann relaxing, and I'm struck. Does he have kids? Yeah, his, yeah, da- his daughters. His, his, daughter. his daughters are filmmakers. Right, uh, so, well, right. no, I, I, I mean, he's got uh, Amy Cannon Mann. Yeah, See, like made a movie and was like a second unit on Heat. I believe. Yes. Um, okay. And I think and he has another a, daughter. He has another. I think so. I think so. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, tell us about he's hanging got out. Four with him, kids, though. according to Wikipedia. How does he dress? 
<laughs> ben is fashion focused. Uh, black jackets. I don't know. You know, I've, cool. I've, 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 I've met Michael Mann in person like three times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, pretty nice guy. Sure. Uh, not nearly as intense as you might imagine. Right. Uh, I would imagine fairly intense, but, but also again, gruff. But also I was not on a movie set with him and I imagine that things get <laughs> a lot hairier there. But, right, um, right, right. But you know, he's, he's a, he can be a, he can be, you know, he's not a chatty guy, but. Sure. But he's, he, you know, he has, like he has a lot of answers that he gives over and over again to questions, but they're good answers. Like right. he's he got his answers his down. Answers, right. Right. And so he actually like, he thinks about his answers. They're thoughtful answers. And he's got kind of got him down. And then, like, if you ask him the same question, he will give you the same answer. Right. It's like, you know, it's like like clockwork. Yeah, you know? yeah right. It's preloaded. Yeah. He's, wait, I had a, it's gone. Whatever my question was, <laughs> it's completely gone. He has his answers. He's a Chicago guy. His dad was a grocer. The Bears. Oh, yeah. The Bulls. Did you ever get an explanation from him as to why beautiful by Alejandro Gonzalez oh. is one of his top 10 movies of all time. And is that still the case? Or like is on it just a list kind of, of nine of, there's nine other movies, one of which is Avatar, which, which is we accept. interesting, but a good choice. Well, he's, I mean, he's friends with Inarritu and he, you know, and, and, like, and he loves, I mean, he loves if, his work. He's also a fan I was of the Revenant. best friends of, with Inarritu. Right. I'd pick the Revenant before Beautiful. Like I feel like Beautiful is yeah. kind of the weird. Was that weird before Revenant? Revenant? That was before Revenant. It might've been. That list is, is that like a sight and sound list? Amores Peros. Yeah, you're right. It's a sight and sound list. It was pre revenant. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so I think Beautiful was probably like just the most recent one. If I were Michael Mann, I would make all of my sight and sound, like the little mm-hmm. paragraphs I write, be like, I'm just friends with Alejandro. Like, I just brag about all the friends I have. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just pick movies where I could be like, I'm friends with you know, Quentin Tarantino. We get eggs. <laughs> like, we go to a diner get sometimes. Eggs. Yeah, I don't know. What does one do with Quentin Tarantino? Sit around playing old board games, probably. Yeah, yeah, I think right. that is exactly. literally what one does. Really? Tarantino, yeah. Really? Is Quentin Tarantino like a big Settlers of Catan guy? No, no, no. I think it's like vintage board games. <laughs> Wasn't that the whole thing? Like I remember at the like during the 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 press blitz for um for a uh, Pulp Fiction, mm-hmm. like the, you know the, all these stories were like you know the actors he wanted. I think maybe Travolta. Oh yeah, they Travolta and he played like the Eight Is Enough board game and that was how <laughs> so they bonded like shitty he likes like kitsch game. right of course, yeah, right. Of course. Right. Yeah. it's very quick yeah. you know yeah. right he's not like a serious like he, cardboard guy he just likes anything that's like a weird object of hollywood marginalia right, right. Yeah. and i mean and, and he succeeded in like turning those things into fetish objects for the rest of us right totally right yeah, i mean so like that's his whole match hong kong movies you know uh black exploitation movies sure. yeah you know, kung fu movies Westerns, these were not things yeah. these were not considered cool at yeah. the time like pre-Tarantino like yeah. he somehow managed to make them cool like right. some of us watch that stuff spaghetti westerns whatever but like most people if you if you said the word spaghetti western would not know what that was in the same pre-pulp right. fiction right. and right. then afterwards you know well th- but then that's kind of the thing with man too which we've <laughs> talked about where it's like he wasn't cool even though he made all these cool things and then they all his movies become cool later through, and the, through TV through airings TV over and over again, and, and, and then film the directors cineasts. he inspires. And, this, right. this and is then the, this uh, movie fell into the exact same trap where people came out, and it, it came out, and people were like, oh, it's kind of bad. Like, right. And then, like, it only took a few years for everyone to be like, was Black Hat kind of great? You yeah. know, like, it only... It, it, I feel it, like it took weeks it took, for it right. to happen. It just, in the yeah. second it exited theaters, everyone was like, wait, right. I haven't seen Black Hat yet. Where'd yeah. it go? <laughs> like, isn't it a masterpiece? It... This is the thing that I always found really baffling about man because I remember I like these movies would come out and I would go to them and come out and I'd say all right that that was good sure but that's going to date really poorly uh-huh like I remember because you know his stuff is so kind of weirdly like contemporary in that sense like yes. the music is very of, of the moment yes. you know it's, he's, Miami he's right. it's like yeah. can we capture right. this exact moment that's yeah. the goal exactly and you to think, get it with yeah. utmost right. accuracy right and right. you think to yourself well in two years this is going to look idiotic right. yeah right and what's amazing is that like that does not happen yeah. these things actually if anything be, they get cooler yeah yeah 100 percent. It, it's almost like they kind of wind up defining what's cool yeah 100 right? like because yeah. that the thing when pacino is in heat I feel like some people at the time are like, here it is, definitive evidence. This guy is so fucking off the rails. Like, right. Sense of a Woman was enough, and now he's just right. screaming Time at of us. Death. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, Pacino Theatrical is, cut. God, yeah. remember what a great actor he used to be. And now people are like, Pacino and Heat's like the best American who ever oh, lived, yeah. right? Like, yeah. they're just like, I love him. What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah. 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 Or, or like, you watch Heat and you're like, God, all this, like, 
self-important, weirdly Dickensian stuff getting into people's lives. Who needs yeah. that? Just give us the crime thriller. You know, cut to 10, 20 years later, everybody's trying to make a crime movie that's like that rich and that deep. Well, you know what's weird? Like, so you saying, you know, in the way that Tarantino made all these things like generally cool for everybody. This is now accepted as cool. Uh, with the Miami Vice TV show, Michael Mann totally did that. Where yeah. you read about all these trends that were created like, Italian suits were not popular in the States. Italian clothing lines sure. were not Pastels popular with men's were wear. Right. Cool. Those yeah. colors, I mean, all these sorts of things. The music he was using, the colors he was using, all this sort of shit. And that show just like hits like a fucking atom bomb oh, and yeah. changes everything. And everyone's like, this is the definition of cool. We have to tune in to follow the trends. You know, uh -huh. the show just becomes like fucking American Bandstand or whatever right. for like trend spotting. And then in his movies, it always is like he's 10 years ahead of oh, yeah. getting the credit for doing the thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, and in fact, I remember when Miami Vice first aired, it was not like that well liked the show. I remember the reviews were pretty the negative. Critics were, I think, kind of like, this is all sound. It's they were like, it's yeah. MTV Cops. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that, that, I mean, that, that was, was actually, pitch. that was yeah. the pitch, that MTV Cops. Right. But then also the, um, I don't remember the ratings being that good. In fact, it, it was kind of. It, it, I can look it was kind of borderline for a while, and I remember and after the it first caught season, on it some way. You know, right. Either the first season or the second season, it actually caught on, and you know they renewed it, and suddenly it was a hit again. Of course, mm -hmm. I think I think Man actually left after the second season. I yeah. think you're right. I mean, Miami Vice is one of those things where you you figure it dominated the eighties, but it was actually it was only five seasons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it kind of wore Heaped out in its the middle. welcome really quickly. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, the, you know, the Emmys turned on it right away. You know what I mean? Like, all of it's... But it was sort of like, I mean, there, there are so many phenomenon like that, like like the OC, where it's oh, like yeah. the OC lands, and it was never the number one show on television, and it was never an award. play. The OC play. is a great... Yeah, right? Same, that, that was yeah. such a flash in the pan, but has lingered like, it, it quite defined a generation. It was dead yes. by year five. Yeah. And like, it, year, no, it only had four years. Four. Four right. seasons. And the fourth season felt like it was on life support the fourth already. Season, right. The fourth season was basically announced as uh, the final season of the OC. You right. Know, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Right. And, but, and, and people like me, who were kind of too old for it when it, when it, yeah. when it aired, we were like, hit. what the fuck is this? Like, right. why right. would anybody watch yeah, this shit? Like, this is garbage. Yeah. Right. But, this is it. It's culture circling the drain. That's it. Yeah. Now the OC is like a tourist mask. Yeah, exactly, television. exactly. But it did, I mean, I like, it set the trends. Like, it redefined fashion, it redefined Absolutely. music, 100%. and all these things. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty fascinating sort of, like, those shows that are so tied into the moment. Yes. It's, it's weirdly, I think, easier to make a show that is so tied into the moment that l works in that moment than it is with a film. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. These sort of, like, flash in the pan, like, you caught wind of a cultural sort of uh, movement. Right sort of shows um i was just, i mean just like you know we talk about a lot i'm so fascinated by just like how fucking long careers are <laughs> how most people just have so many different acts to their career do you remember when like oh olivia wilde is playing the bisexual bartender in four episodes of the oc yeah, and her like, being like eight but when they announced like oh she's got a, a run it was like here's the next big star yeah like to have a guest Arc. was a big deal. They would the OC guest stars like, in the OC with like Vogue photo shoots. Right. Basically. And they were like, this is going to be your next leading lady. Yeah. And then it was like, oh, I guess that didn't happen. And then she comes back on House. Well, Olivia Wilde's one of the bigger breakouts of the OC. Right. I mean, the OC is littered with people who right. like never got to escape the gravity But I'm saying of the like OC. she yeah. didn't have the OC pop yeah, well, that everyone thought she was going to have right. and then had the career that the other like OC Chris Pratt did. was in the OC. You right. know, like so there's a lot of yeah. Yeah. guest stars of the OC. Yeah. OC. Miami Vice is similar. It is. I mean, for well, I mean, the, Jimmy the, Smith. No, well, the, I mean, the guest stars were insane. Yeah. yeah, but some of them were also you know big at the time too. Yeah, right. and the Frank, Frank Z, I just, yeah. I, This weekend, I watched an episode where Frank Zappa played an elusive drug oh, drug God. lord, and it was just watch that app. Is uh, it on Hulu or one of these I have, things? I have, Netflix, I have them on DVD. You, just, yeah. I, you know, I'm a physical media guy. Me too. I'm a, yeah. Yeah. I know they have they remaster them all. Oh, remind me, I have a present for you. What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a present you. I was supposed to give you like 10 months ago. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Got I don't have it on me. Just remind me at some oh, point. Sure. Ding dong. Oh, okay. Ding dong, ding Who's dong. at the door? Oh. That bass line. What's the deal with this studio? Uh, wow. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld? Whoa, uh, fame comedian. Fame comedian Jerry Seinfeld, who's clearly had just recently been punched somewhere. <laughs> it's not a stew. I can't eat it with a spoon. It's not a dio. 
I'm literally. Why do they call it Estonia? Yeah, I don't know, but it, clearly you want to talk to someone about it. Podcast. Why do they call it that? It's not a pond. Well, oh, we're gonna find a P inside. The well. technology that it was initially associated with is called the iPod, and then they were like, "Let's make this own kind of form of broadcasting." So they took the word "pod" and it attached it to "cast," so you got "podcast." Okay, Ben, I don't really want an answer. Oh, sorry, Jerry. I mean, I'm asking these rhetorical questions because I can't figure out how to actually open that- up to somebody and oh. tell oh. them the things that really scam me. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I didn't realize you were weighing with that. Well, uh, Like, you- what's the deal with these thoughts that race through my head at night? <laughs> okay, well, you could turn to Talkspace. What? Because it's like they can provide you a person to support you through the rough patches and the everyday ups and downs of life. Uh, I'll probably be like Elaine and make fun of me, huh? Jerry, I've used this service, so I'm going to tell you some something about it. What's okay. so great is uh, you're you're a man on the go. You're yeah. driving around with comedians getting coffee. And cars! Yeah. And what would be nice if you're feeling like a kind of a moment of like uh, 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 not feeling well. Perpetually, 24-7, 365. You have these questions. You could just access a talk space therapist anytime, anywhere. It's so convenient. Uh, it's right well, at your you fingertips. You say anytime, anywhere. I don't like the popping. I don't like people popping into my apartment like Kramer. I don't you want the popping. You hate the popping. He is exhausted. Sheesh. But what's been great is like I, I've been using this service and, and it's really helped me through a rough patch of my life. And I was always able to access a therapist. They were yep. uh, personalized. It's quite affordable. It's you affordable. know, one month of therapy costs about the same amount as a single face-to-face session. Well, I want to I just reestablish the idea that I'm worried about the pumping and wonder how this service would work around my fear of the pumping. Oh, you, it's convenient and easy to use. You can send unlimited messages to your dedicated therapist from the privacy of your device anytime. Any oh, first of all, they don't day. have to come into my physical space. No, not at all. It's, well, this it's, feels it's like you all... should have picked up on that. It's like the thread I was putting there. Jerry, listen to me. Don't like the pumping. Listen to me, Jerry. Be quiet. <laughs> Talkspace has more than 5,000 licensed therapists who are experienced in addressing the challenges we all face. I mean, I feel like you're <laughs> addressing one of my issues, which is I can't stop talking. <laughs> to match with the perfect therapist for a fraction of the price of traditional therapy, go to Talkspace.com, make sure to use the code CHECK, and you'll get $65 off your first month. And you'll support, so you show your support for blank checks. What's the deal with checks? Sometimes they're a public. Sometimes they bounce. Baby. Mental health is important. Do a little really self care for yourself. I feel like we should aim for Seinfeld. I feel like you guys shouldn't have said those two things at the same time. They were very different points. <laughs> Sorry. What did you say, Ben? Mental health is important. <laughs> That's true. We'll and I'm like, let's get Seinfeld. Very serious and earnest. <laughs> All right. That's check. Talkspace.com. You're going to get $65 off your first month. What's the deal with months? Should we talk about the plot of Black Hat? I feel like we <laughs> kind of covered it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when do, does he wear a black hat? In it? Uh, he in the finale would have been nice if Hemsworth had a white hat and the bad guy had yeah. a black hat. That would have been that cool. would have been a clean sort of thing right. for me. This has such he a goes man, to lids and just gets a blank. This has such a classic hat. man ending too. It is crazy that every man movie except for Public Enemies basically is the same ending where it's like he's alive and he won. But at you know now what does he do? Right. Like now you're sort of like now he just yeah. walks the world exactly yeah. right. You got to just walk the earth with the world against you. Yeah. yeah, guy walking into a guy walking through a door basically. Right. That's the, right. that's the Maybe end of every other Michael Mann kind of like yeah. not looking at the camera. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, at the day we're recording this, the uh, the Ford uh, Ferrari trailer just came out yesterday. Yeah. So people will be able to carbon date this episode recording. Uh And that was what he had. His sort of biggest intended follow up to Black Hat was announced. I think he was going to the con film market with Christian Bale attached. And they were going to try to get financing to make a big uh, Ferrari biopic with Christian Bale. And uh, I feel like uh, uh, Mangold uh, doing it has like. Completely kills that possibility, right? Especially with right. since Christian Bale is in this other movie, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that is, it yeah. is so weird that Christian Bale is in a movie with the word Ferrari in the title, right? Well, well I, as I understand it, Christian Bale because he would have been playing Enzo Ferrari, right. and had to was going to have to gain weight or something like sure. that. Yeah, Christian and, Bale was like, "Let me at this." Like he yeah. had yeah. the like 
sandwich at the ready, right? Like, <laughs> right. He's like, like a giant bowl fat. of pasta, yeah, exactly. waiting for the contract to be signed. Mix <laughs> some pop tarts into that. I can't wait to eat it. Right? Do you, do you remember that Simpsons Treehouse of Horror with the ironic punishment department, where Homer has to go to hell, where they just feed him donuts all the time? And he's like chained into a chair, <laughs> yes, and, oh, yeah. and they're just loading yeah, the donuts yes. into his mouth. Yeah. I think that's like uh, Christian Bale has a room in his house, right? That's just fats yeah. that get right. funneled in. Yeah. <laughs> um, but do you, right. So what? What do you think happened with him moving over? I mean, that was what like definitively nail on the coffin killed the man movie. It felt like. Well, I think there was at some point Bale dropped out, and it was going to be Hugh Jackman, if right. I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. Um, who I'd love to see work with Michael Mann. Oh, yeah. I feel like Mann could do a lot with Mike with Jackman. Yeah, I think I think I think that could work out too. I mean, I you know who knows the um, the Ferrari movie was like the Ferrari script mm -hmm. was a script that he wrote around the same time that he wrote Heat, so mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's basically like thirty years old. Yeah, yeah and yeah. it was also I think similar to Heat. It was one of those scripts where he felt like he'd never quite licked the ending sure. mm -hmm. and then like finally felt like he'd licked the ending right um but of course you know the times have changed and you know it's not easy to get a movie like that made now right i assume that's not going to happen but who knows i mean he's also if you remember i mean michael mann produced the aviator of course because he right. had his howard hughes movie yeah right? that, like and there was there were kind of competing howard hughes movies which right. which wound up not happening but right um, and he was supposed to direct that, I believe. Yeah. And why did he, did he drop out to do Collateral? Am I, I think he dropped that? out to do Miami Vice. That's so He dropped right. out, the thing he dropped out yeah. of for Miami Vice was Tonight He Comes, which later became oh, yeah. Hancock. Right. Because uh -huh. he right, also right. has a producing credit on Hancock. He does, he does. Yeah. And that well, we was know, like. He got a Best Picture nomination right. for it. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> but that was like one of the best unmade scripts in Hollywood and was very much like a character piece. And not a black comedy in the same way, and not a movie with action set pieces. Look, I'll watch his Hancock. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed like the first half of Hancock. Too. Actually, right, well, because lot. Peter Berg is like a like roided up, slightly less introspective man. Oh yeah, like, right. You know, he's right. definitely and, 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 a, oh, yeah. indebted Insightful. to Michael Mann. And, right. And, yeah. I mean, Mann, I think has produced like three of his movies. Yeah, they're yeah. they're buds. And right? He's in Collateral. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Michael Mann uh, was uh, in the movie Battleship. He, uh, yeah, I was gonna make a joke about the movie Battleship, and I couldn't remember a fucking was, thing about he was, it. He was one of the he was one of the old sailors. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I mean, he'd be good at that, probably yeah, yeah. barking he, orders. He played a red peg. Like That's he the could, joke. he could play. Yeah, right. Come on, David. He played a red. He played peg. a red peg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he could play any role written for Gene Hackman, right? Like, it'll give, oh, yeah. give me that. Like, just put Michael Mann in a movie. Like, I'd love to see give him Michael that Werner Herzog. Yeah. Like, sure, I'll play some villains. I don't know. Yeah, I'll play. Yeah, see, has guy. he actually done any movie? Like, Michael Cameron's Mann. Movie? Yeah, I don't think so. Has he? I feel like oh. maybe there's like a. I feel like they're. Yeah. What are some other like lost Michael Mann projects? I've been right, trying to Google this while we're talking Gates of Fire. Gates of Fire is the one. That's like that one. I. What is that? That is the that was the competing version of three hundred. No, it wasn't three hundred, uh, but that was sure. the other um, the ancient. Uh, yeah, the Battle of Thermopylae yeah, kind of thing. And I've read that seat. script. It's kind of a great script. Um, Fuck. So Agincourt I, is the other one that I know he still wants to do about the Battle of Agincourt. Mm. I'm just gonna sidebar cool. here for one second. Yeah, you looked up his acting credits. Did you look him up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I executive in Hancock. Right. There's a scene with the boardroom, and he's one of the guys. Whatever. Right, right, right. And then the other thing, we've talked about this. Because uh, I scrolled. We've scrubbed the image. We don't know. They say he's in the Tai Chi class and intern. There are two the intern, Chai, Nancy tai Chi the classes intern. at the beginning of the end of the movie. Where De Niro is kind of like, you know, like like this. And, and there's I like a bunch scrubbed. of other, you know, There's the bookends citizens. of the film looking for Michael Mann anywhere. I certainly believe he could be in there. Yeah. I have seen other people could not recognize him. My, Nancy Myers is kind of the female Michael Mann, and Michael Mann is kind of the male Nancy Myers. Sure. Incredibly meticulous, over budget filmmakers, but also like just you know lifestyle porn. Right, hundred yeah, yeah. yes. percent. What makes right, a right, woman? Right. What makes a man? Yeah, a hundred percent. And right. also, right, just you imagine them sending six months dressing an apartment set that right. is going to be featured for two scenes or whatever. Right. So right. I totally believe they're good friends, and she was like, "Come on by," yeah. <laughs> you know. But I we cannot find him visually in that movie. Movie. No, uh, Nancy and or Michael speak to this, please. Come that is on, interesting, though, that his like big unmade movies are sort of greater epics than he has ever been able to pull off in terms of like big historical action. Yeah. And, and, and I believe the Agincourt story was going to be kind of following a character sort of through that world. And sure. Um, Sounds cool. I mean, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to see him do it. I, I haven't read that script or anything like that, but um, but I know the Gates of Fire script. And that was a film that was kind of, I mean, that was 
that went through multiple directors and, right. and producers and stuff like that. So and stars, and I think Clooney was involved at some point. Love to see um, them work together. But uh, but that was you know that was a that was a great script. I, that would have been awesome to see man tackle it. <sighs> I mean, you know, the the thing is, Last of the Mohicans is such a great movie. Yes, it is. That you you look at that and you're like. It would have been interesting to, to see him do more kind of like heavy period stuff like that Absolutely. as opposed to just like kind of, you know, within the realm of sort of crime. Uh, I was just Googling. That he also has been over the last uh, six or seven years talking up Big Tuna a lot, oh, which right, is supposed yeah, yeah. to be another like Chicago uh, 40s mob movie. <laughs> You're telling me he has a movie called Big Tuna? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I am, I am all you. in. Uh, and now he has this imprint, this publishing imprint. Big Tuna is going to be a book. crime novel. So yeah. now it's like, well, I'm going to make Big Tuna as a book. Right. I'm like executive producing this book. So that then hopefully the book will inspire people to give me money to make the movie. That's funny. Yeah, and, it's and, a, it's a, Big Tuna was a Capone associate. That's who that is. Okay. And, and I think I'm um, also, uh, you know, like the first book in this, in his imprint came mm-hmm. out called Hunting LaRue. And it's actually a nonfiction book. Uh, I, I don't like, I think the imprint is meant mainly for fiction. Mm-hmm. But he decided to go with this, um, this nonfiction one. Uh, and it's interesting because the guy... That it's about. It's this guy Paul Larue, who was this like crime lord who started off as a. He was from Rhodesia, and he started off in cybersecurity, and he started and then started selling like pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals online. You know, so like if you needed uh, like prescription meds, but you didn't have a prescription, you could get them from Australia or wherever. Sure. He started selling that, and then he eventually got into like arms dealing and all sorts of crazy shit. And he's basically the guy in Black Hat. Interesting. Right? But like man did not know about this guy when he was when he when he was writing Black Hat or like he found out about him later. Wow. But even like the the nationality weirdly matches up because you know, LaRue's from Rhodesia and then the guy in Black Hat has like this Dutch accent. Right. You know, it's like it's like yeah. these weird and he kind of looks like him because he's like kind of this dumpy guy. <laughs> um it's very strange how they match up. Uh but it's like totally coincidental. And I'm looking this up. The next book uh, scheduled to be published by his imprint is a uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog <laughs> and the Easter Parade. But that, that seems like okay. a weird. I'll pinch you. I'll pinch you. That's God. Clifford talking. I don't burn people. <laughs> I'm a big egg. red dog, you fucking egg. <laughs> <laughs> Public enemy is the insult of you dumb egg. Is How great would it line. be if they were like, uh, you know, this is happening more and more these days. Walt Becker has been fired mid-production from the live-action <laughs> Clifford the Big Red Dog movie and replaced it with Michael Mann. I mean, it's doing like Doing a page one rewrite. I feel like Mann, is, we're now, we've been. You ever see a dog this fucking big? <laughs> you know, it's like, we've, we've, we've talked about this. <laughs> <laughs> what drew you to the project? This, never heard of a bigger dog. <laughs> um, like Man, Fincher, Scorsese, these mm-hmm. guys where studios are now like, it's not even worth the prestige to us anymore. Right. Yeah. It's going to be too expensive. We know what you're like. Mm-hmm. You're old. You're, you know, not going to take any notes. We have no control. And it's going to cost too much money. And yeah. like, even though like it'll get Oscar and buzz time, and good reviews. All, it's like, how fucking long is this going like, to take? We just us? don't want to work with you anymore. Like, yeah. that's my great. Greatest fear about the movie industry is that sort of mindset. And it looked for a while like the Netflixes and Amazons of the world like, were, sure, we're here going we are to, to pick like, up yeah, the check, right? Right, but even there, I think kind of moving away from that. I mean, right. Netflix obviously has the Scorsese thing, but do you really think that they're going to be making more movies like that? Can I or? give you my no. theory? On I mean, that? it's not impossible oh, yeah. that like they have sort of the budget for like one of those a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I give you my theory? Yeah, you can. So you know how there's this trend with television where, like, when Fox started, when UPN started, and even when WB started, they're like, we are targeting African Americans. Sure, sure. We are going to cater to an underserved market in television. And the second they had a breakout hit with white people on it, they were like, duh, 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 duh. like, now we get to do the thing we wanted to do, white people TV shows, right. you know? They always use them as a way to get their footing. I think, weirdly, in this streaming era, these companies have done the same thing with prestige projects mm. like amazon came in and like got ted hope and we're like let's get all the 90s auteurs yeah amazon was like with stillman spike lee like yeah. right like they had jim that jarmusch. Run, jim jarmusch right. right let's call them all up let's get these what guys, what's the script yeah. in your closet what's the thing in your drawer that you haven't gotten to make you know yeah. it's like the expendables of auteurs 100 yeah. of 90s like early right. indie yeah right and i think what they were trying to do was not to rope the audience in but to uh destigmatize uh the sort of lower rent idea of it being a streaming thing so it's mm-hmm. like if you get Alfonso Cuaron 
to trust you with his like very slow, meticulous housekeeper drama and right. you push that movie properly, then filmmakers feel more comfortable going to Netflix with their movies, knowing mm-hmm. they'll be handled correctly. What Netflix is actually in it for is less trying to find the next Roma and more trying to find the next Bright. Right, right. And right, the big right. thing is how do you make it not look low rent to Will Smith to right. do an action movie sure. for yeah. you? Right. You know? Yes. I do. Know. And some of that I think also does expand, you know, their their subscriber footprint. Too. Of course. Right? Like doing something like Godless. Of course. You know, which is like they they didn't have a Western. And there are probably a lot of, you know, guys out there who want to watch Westerns who maybe got a Netflix subscription because of it. But I am also sure, you know, in their endless uh uh buckets and buckets of uh data and metrics that they will never share with the public. Right. That they saw like, oh, the people who are watching stuff on Netflix streaming are nerds. Yeah. Let's make things for nerds, for like <laughs> underserved, like niche genres. No, for sure. For you sure. You know, because these are the people who are like, you watch it on the Netflix, on your computer, <laughs> you know, like we'll get them later. We'll get yeah, to the right. ranch eventually. Right. You know, yeah, but yeah. like for the time being, like, what do you put on here that people will connect to? And I think we're just going to see more and more like. If they wanted to be prestige channels, they would have cultivated the sort of like HBO standard of quality thing of just like we make sure we so rarely dip below this. And all these stream platforms are like prestige is a way to get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. It really helps to win some Emmys. Yes. In love order to awards. get more They're people. always going to love right. awards. Yes. But they're always going to prioritize. But now it's like, like Amazon has Lord of the Rings. Netflix right. has The Witcher. Right. Just announced a Magic the Gathering series. Right. Which, by the way. Fully in support of. Can't wait to see their take on Jose Molina, uh, yeah. one of the showrunners on it. Wonderful man who wrote for the Tick. Oh, cool. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. A show that was canceled by Amazon because it's too niche. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I think, uh, I, I think, yes. It, it's like there might have been a window where Michael Mann could have gotten Amazon or Netflix to bankroll his crazy movie. Yeah, and I think he missed that window. I think they're already now like I think the Irishman might be the last of a certain type of prestige film bankrolled by the streaming services before the pendulum swings again. Right. We'll see. I, at that level, I don't know if it's going to happen again. Where I disagree with David is unlike the other guys you're roping him in with, I think Scorsese will go back to being able to make studio film. I think a lot of that's through oh, yeah, yeah. the DiCaprio I think, connection. I think, of course, that his box I'm not saying it's impossible. Yeah. I'm just saying it, it's gone from studios like jockeying to right. make a Michael Mann movie, of course, whatever, to that being a high risk. Okay, you know that kind of a project. And even yeah. when everything became more like bean counter number cruncher, I'm just like, trying to re- reckon with the fact that Mann hasn't made another movie. Of course, this is all I'm talking and about. And a lot here. of it. I mean, honestly, it's not that dissimilar from you know like when you're a writer and or, or like you're a freelance writer and you're working with one editor and then that editor leaves yeah. and a new one comes in and you don't know where you stand with them i mean with michael mann and some of these guys they were often protected by studio heads yeah not of prote- course protected no no you're totally, right. you're totally right studio heads who are like they're listen, vouching for them this we is, need, this is part of the business this is one project. of our guys yes. right he comes to us with a project we're going to take a serious look at it right um, warner brothers yeah. used to be famous for that where it was right. like we want to be the yankees we want to yeah. have the strongest in-house roster yeah and now pretty much they've said like we're not giving director's cut to anyone other than our three guys clint eastwood yeah. christopher nolan what's the other one Todd Phillips. Those are the three guys they refer to. It's just like, we want to keep them I mean, in house. Even Todd Phillips is making a fucking superhero movie. Of course. I mean, not sure. to say, it's not no, like that but, means that sure. their culture is ending no, or but anything. That's, like, I, but. Right. It is, that is sort of the, the point, yeah. you know? Maybe yeah. Michael Mann should make Booster Gold. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, he should, maybe he should make Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> bring, just back Hancock. bring back yeah. Hancock yeah I mean honestly they're gonna run out of superheroes I also, soon they're gonna have to bring yeah, back Hancock Hancock will join the MCU <laughs> I will say I have read Tonight He Comes uh-huh. it is so radically different yes, from yes, what they yes, end up yes, making yes. they could just make it right. it's one of those you things you can just call it Tonight He Comes you're like, so the guy got paid money for this script that no way resembles in any Th- this yeah. is a guy who did Heat as a TV miniseries, right. and then did it like a verbatim yeah. as a movie, yeah. and you, somehow one was bad and the other. I know was that's good. the thing about LA Takedown where you can't, it's so weird. You're they're, it's the same lines, yeah. It's and it, there's it's so boring. I've often said if I ever taught a, a, a yes, filmmaking you just show class those two movies, or even right. like yeah. an acting class, an acting just like class. show the diner scene from LA Takedown and right. show the diner scene from Heat. 
I mean, it's like verbatim. It is, and it's, it's like, like a high school production of a Shakespeare play yeah, versus yeah. like the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah, right. But it's like the same guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very strange. <laughs> it is the most incredible argument for movie stardom. <laughs> yes, it, it really is. Yeah, it, it's incredible. <sighs> What's up? I'm just tired, David. Me too. I'm tired of walking home, sure, picking up a package and realizing it's just a box of mediocre. Oh yeah, sure. That that'll happen. You get your mail and it's like bills. Yeah, this is a box of okay. Yeah, it's a box of whatever. It's a box of perfunctory. But you know, David, there's one exception. Once a month. Once a month. Something cool this arrives. This has been happening to you too. Yes. Once a month, it's like I I would say I get like a box of awesome. Bespoke posts. These guys. For you out, too. They're out scouting for quality. Oh my god. Unique products. Yeah. That they can send you in a box every month. Yeah. If you go to boxofawesome.com, right, they will send you. Something cool. Now, but yeah, no, I'm looking, Ben. I mean, last this month it just arrived. Scroll down, Ben. I want to. I want to get the exact name of it. The Hecho. I'm I sorry. Got the Hecho box. I'm sorry. The what? Yeah. Move your mouse, Ben. It's like pestle and mortar. Turn your screen so I can see. Yeah. I need to see this. Four little glass bottles so I can make hot sauce oh, and wow. store it. It's got like one of those little taco baking trays. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Spice mix uh -huh. has all this stuff. A funnel that like. I can use to make um, guacamole and hot sauce and tacos and like, you know, that's one of the many things they have. Okay. Ben, they have fashion stuff. Then scroll up, scroll okay, up okay. because I want to blow your mind for right, a second right. here. Or I'm Last, sorry, scroll down. Or now I don't know where it is on the page, but I'll tell you what I got, David. Okay, what'd you get? I got, it's called the vacation box. Oh, what's that one? Yeah. I don't, it, yeah. It's for tropical mixed drinks. Oh. And I got two... Alcoholic beverage glasses that look like pineapples. And I like this because I'm a ridiculous person. sort of person. metal ones that you can like separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know those. Mm -hmm. like I like tiki. this because I'm a ridiculous person and I like to have fun. Yes. And that for me is great. But also you can get some essential because the last time what I get, I got the weekender bag. Yeah, you got the bag. Perfectly last time I got the shine box, I got sunglasses. Oh, you, go, you went and got your shine box. All right, let's stay away from that. Um, but no, it's really you don't great. don't want to go get your shine box. If you're in search of the perfect drink, well-kept pad, jet setting and style, bespoke posts, you, you can Grooming pick and supplies. select. Grooming supplies. I got one called the Cannonball that has stuff for, like, the swimming pool, like a little inflatable dinosaur that you can put a drink on. So your drink is there in the pool with you. Each box goes for under 50 bucks, but it's got more than $70 worth of unique gear waiting inside for you. First of each month, you're going to get an email with your box details. You have five Days to change colors or sizes or add extra goods. If you're not feeling the box, you can skip it. The cannonball looks awesome. It's like a dragon. Fire's coming out of his mouth. And it also comes with molds for popsicles. Here's the thing. To receive 20% off your first subscription box, you can go to boxofawesome, boxofawesome.com and enter code CHECK at checkout. Boxofawesome.com, code CHECK for 20% off your first box. Bespoke post, that's theme boxes for guys that give a damn. It sounds great. It just Can you do one of here for me, David? Yeah. Uh, go get your shine box. Okay. Um, so, Viola Davis in Black Hat. Mm -hmm. Terrific. It's great performance. Great performance. Great performance. I, I, I love that scene. I created my head where she has it. <laughs> but it's also like, I yeah. think uh, that's an, another nice thing about the director's cut is that you get more of her. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, it takes a little while for Hemsworth to come in. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. it actually does feel more like an ensemble piece, oh, which I think. Especially like a two hander. Like, yeah. Especially now that you're watching, you're like, this should be Chris Hemsworth and Viola Davis above the title Both. together. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Because she becomes a movie star like right around now. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and it's really um, like it, it just works so much better as a film that's not about the hero hacker who must like do all this stuff. Yeah, like, he's course, kind of part right. of a team. Yeah. This is also, and we need to talk about it because it's been a running theme throughout our main series. This is the best female character in any of his movies. Close to. And it's, way. I argue it is because it's the only, not that I'm saying this is the only test you should apply to female characters, but I think it is ah. helpful to do that test of just like, uh, is, is this character in any way defined by them being female? Because so often female characters in movies are yeah, yeah, their yeah. entire function is connected to the fact that they are female, what their relationship is to someone else, you know? And this is just like a character that could have been played by a, a male Anyone actor. Yeah. Sure, but I mean, but one could also argue that there's nothing, you know, that that, that uh, having a character who is defined by the fact that they're female isn't necessarily, you know, like you don't necessarily write strong women characters just by 
yeah, writing characters who could also be men. Characters. I, I mean, agree. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's not a unilateral like, I think no, Gong does. Lee's character in Miami Vice is she's, kind of She's the other argument. Like, that's I think a good one. I mean, she's yeah. a really moving I love that. I mean, that's one yes. of my favorite. I, that's a good argument. And more backstory, more backstory, by the way, than anyone else in that movie yes you know yeah um and we haven't recorded that episode yet that's right. the only reason i feel okay. like she's not pinging for you that's the only episode that, we haven't recorded that is yet. probably the fact yeah i'm um, trying to but yeah i mean certainly also Vi- viola is just so as good. she is in almost any movie such yeah. a talent that like, oh yeah you can give her a very thinly written role right not that this is per se but yeah. like you know and she can bring a ton to it we've talked about this before i think but uh, that she says in interviews that her like uh, acting model is a cat right later she likes watching cats a lot mm. And she's like, cat behavior is so fascinating. If you watch a cat and you can't figure out what they're thinking and you can't figure out when they're going to pounce and when they're going to recoil and all of that. Right. That she's like, no human being will ever be more interesting to watch than any random cat. (laughs) But my goal is to try to get as close as I can. Yeah. And so many of the scenes in this where like she's in an office with John Ortiz and it's her just her glances and her blinks and you're just going like, what the fuck is this woman thinking? Yeah. I, I did think like this is like watching a cat. Like, this is like, is she about to blow up mm-hmm. or is she going to quietly walk out of the room? Yeah. Um, and her death scene is one of the, is yeah. it pro- probably the best, like, moment in this movie. It's very yeah, That whole sequence, and it yeah. falls at a perfect point in the movie. And uh, it does feel like kind of like, what's the, you know, like all like a good all is lost moment. Yeah, yeah but also like the just the man's intent of trying to, like, get in his character's heads. Yeah. And you see that little, like, the tower that just kind of fades out in the fog and mm-hmm. it's like you're like this is the last thing this woman's ever going to see you know like it's Jesus. really really just like sends Ooh, shivers up your spine that's profound yeah oh yeah. uh, i mean this movie the deaths are all so sort of abrupt like that like even the the final triumphant screwdriver stabbings they're, like they're meaningless in that sort of way that he is obsessed with where it's like death is such a brutal act and then that affects the people around them so much but the actual the act the physical act of violence upon you that kills you is so sort of abrupt and weird and then the black hat guy sadak whatever is you know is yeah. it, he has that line where he's like yeah he's gone now so i'm not good like why yeah, right. be sympathetic like why have emotions about it he's not right. here anymore yeah the player like, has exited the later. player has exited the game <laughs> you know? right yeah. right black hat hacker black hat it is such a good black tongue. hat hacker black hat hacker no but yeah. it's a black hat hacker named hathaway <laughs> that's the tongue no, twister he's not a black hat he's a white hat yeah I guess they call him a black they, hat at the beginning. He could, kind of becomes the thing one. he was arrested for. I was, think was, was a little was, black hat. Yeah, yeah. But they don't. They don't. I think it was the trailer, right, where they say the actual words "black hat hacker" named Hack yeah, Hathaway, which they don't in the movie. They don't in the movie. No. Right. I think that was a moment where people were laughing at the trailer. Yeah. When they say black hat hacker, well, fuck black them. hat hack, <laughs> black hat hacker. Uh, so we got. We also we should talk about uh, Lee Hong Wong and Tong Wei uh-huh. uh, from Lust Caution, yes. which we've covered on this podcast. Uh-huh. They were lovers there. Yes, they are. Brother, uh, brother and sister, and sister here. here. Yeah, uh, Tong Wei's pretty great. I agree. Uh, yeah, I think she falls a little bit prey to just I. I sense in her that thing that happens where it's just like her facility with English. She speaks well in this movie, but you can kind of tell that she's uncomfortable. Sure, you know. Yeah, I, I think the scenes where she is speaking in her native language, she is so much more sort of arresting. She's just in her sort in of physical presence, caution. right? And in less caution. That some of the English language scenes in this movie, I just see the trepidation of someone who's like, I hope I'm getting this right, you know? Yeah. yeah. But she is very good in it. Uh, and he's very good, too. We already shouted out whole McElhaney. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait for season two of Man- Mind Hunter. Where is that? Bring me that. Uh, I've, I, that seems to be, uh, on route. Yes. No, no. From what I hear, it's, it's like a Fincher thing. I mean, the studio stopped working with Fincher as well. And he moved over to TV. He set up three HBO projects. They shut all of them down. Two of them were already filming because he was too difficult. And apparently, uh, Mindhunter has just been very, very slow coming back together. But I also like, uh, you know, I have actor friends who have worked on Mindhunter who are like, it's the fucking best. Right. Uh, he's there the whole time and he's there the whole time and you get to spend like four days working on two lines uh you know and and then the opposite of that is soderbergh where they're like it's great you do 27 pages in two hours (laughs) um i I feel like actors want one or the other 
Yeah. The, the middle is what but I mean. They don't like want. when I talked to Soderbergh about High Flying Bird, he couldn't stop emphasizing how fast the iPhone makes everything. Yeah. Like, he just loves, he's like, you set up so quickly. Right. It's great. And, and then I, you just walk over there and you set up again. And like, I'm in the van going back from set and I'm editing the footage. <laughs> right. By that night, I've already put it into the timeline. Um, no, I, I, I have heard from people who are supposed to be in the next season of uh, My Hunter right. that were like, I've been like on hold for six months. Right. Presumably, I'm going to film it sometime. I don't know when we're starting. I'm not allowed to work. I'm supposed to be in it. <sighs> Weird industry. Weird industry. Weird industry. So you were at the, the BAM screening of the director's cut. I was. When First was time that? he showed it. Yes. Is yeah. that like a couple years later? Like, is that 2017? Uh, it's 2016. February 2016. Okay, so it's, so like, it's like a year later. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's yeah. one year later. year later. And he said at the time that he wasn't done. Of course. Like, he hinted that he was still going to be editing. But at the yeah. same time, I, I like, he... Like, the film is, was, I think, kind of out of his hands. Okay. Even though he had Final Cut and sure. everything, but he doesn't own the movie. Mm-hmm. And I think that was actually kind of a big deal. Like, legendary like, like, like it's Legendary's movie. Because right. right. I remember asking him something like, um, I said, oh, you know, will the, will the director's cut be, you know, Available released or whatever? Yeah. And, and he said, it's, it's really Legendary's call. And I think I even asked them, you know, like backstage about like, is there ever going to be like a soundtrack right, album yeah. release for Black Hat? And he was like, it's, it's really not up to me at all. It's very weird how persistent the director's cut has been in terms of popping up every like six to eight months oh, in yeah. different places without ever being like consistently available anywhere. No, that's, that's only available strange. watching on like fucking FX with commercial breaks now, yeah. you yeah. know, I or had... that it was on TNT. Yes. You can't rent it anywhere. No. They've never released it digitally. Yeah. Yeah. I had assumed that why we had not gotten a physical release or whatever is because he was still tinkering. He, but maybe it's also be. just an unprofitable uh, I mean, proposition. You're also going the digital age. Is, Isn't it just like pushing a button? I agree. Them? I don't right. fucking know. This, I mean, this is, well, but, but that's, that's what they've done. Is I know. That they, you know, yeah. FX has been, you know. But, um, I mean, this is a movie whose star is Australian. Yes. But its Australian release was scrapped yeah. after its opening weekend because it was so... It just did so poorly. Its yeah. Chinese release was scrapped. Right. Yeah, it and like half the movie, you look at it, it's like, oh, right. this was designed yeah, to be released it, in China. It's insane that this movie never came out in China. Like, That's crazy. Or, it came out in Hong Kong, but not in China. Yeah, it didn't, it's not like it made any money. Right, in Hong they just Kong. completely yeah. abandoned this. Yeah, it did come out in the United Kingdom. You know, it had some international release, but uh, yeah, not in. They, they didn't come out in China. It's but it's cr- I mean, we've been grabbing on this uh, uh, the whole mini series. It's crazy that this is his lowest grossing film, unadjusted, including Thief and the Keep. Yeah, really? Like, including, including like Manhunter? Yeah, yeah including oh, wow. all of them. Like wow. adjusted for inflation, it is roundly beaten. Yeah, yeah. But even unadjusted, the keep does more theatrically than this does. No, the keep no? is the one that does. Oh, really? The keep is four point two unadjusted. Okay. But, but it beats it adjusted. Right. Thief is like eight. Uh Thief Thief made eleven. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Which adjusted as 37. I mean, right. they've, they've played. And this opens to number 11 and makes seven in total. Eight. 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 Okay. Yeah. Gotta give him some credit. No. Worldwide <laughs> no. or domestic? Domestically. Domestic. Uh, domestic at eight. Worldwide 19. Okay. Not, Not good. That is good. just. It yeah, costs 70. Yeah. Cost seven. I thought it cost a little more. But I, I mean, yeah. I'm, it may have. I feel like more. that's legendary's reported it number. Does, it's not like it looks like an incredibly expensive movie, but it was filmed in all sorts of places. Right. Yeah. Uh, it has some of those location, like that shot in Malaysia of the you know the tin, yeah, mines or what you know like is incredible. Like what's that place? Like, oh, yeah. I, tell me more. <laughs> Legendary <laughs> says they lost ninety million dollars on it. Um, the soundtrack thing is also interesting because it, what, it's two credit. People. It's Harry Gregson Win- uh, Williams and Atticus Ross, right? Yeah. Who worked with the uh, Trent Reznor yeah, on yeah, his yeah. scores, and, and, and Harry well, Gregson Williams was. Upset. Both moment. of them have right. said that they don't recognize any of their compositions <laughs> well, in the half movie. Half the score is the score from Elysium, right? Which He's is so amazing. Weird. Like, yes, you know. I know. But it, just, just like to imagine that was like he used that as a temp track. Then red line score right. and stuff. Like, yeah. I think he uses things but as he, temp tracks and then gets so committed to them that right. he's just like, just license it. Yeah, right. But yeah. they were like, we don't hear any of our score in this movie. We don't stand by this. It's a weird score. And Michael Mann's response was like, if you want people to hear your music, be a fucking recording artist. <laughs> <laughs> like he had some public statement that was like. If you're a composer, you hand me the thing and I'll do whatever the fuck I want with it, you goddamn egg. <laughs> that is my impression of Michael Mann. <laughs> you dumb egg. You dumb egg. 
Get um, out of my face, Hemsworth. So let's let's look at this box office okay. weekend. Um, we all know the movie The Crush. So this is the Martin Luther King weekend. American Sniper. This is the weekend American Sniper goes wide. It's the weekend American Sniper. Uh, its gross increases by eighteen thousand percent. Uh, yeah, going wide, it makes a hundred and seven million dollars. Crazy in its fourth week of release. An R-rated drama opening in January, making a hundred million dollars opening weekend. Yeah, it goes and you know opening weekend right yeah. but uh, wide it goes release, from yes. four screens to 3500 right um american sniper you and cannot overstate how effective that trailer the is. thing that that is one of the great it's a very good trailer trailers um like black hat should probably not be opening on martin luther king weekend anyway okay. but no one knew no one knew american sniper was gonna obviously eat its lunch with be the that. highest grossing <laughs> film of that year yeah um but uh the other thing that doesn't make any sense is like like but i'm saying like, also i would not say that american sniper should be opening on martin luther yeah. weekend either seemed weird but uh like again quote unquote opening yeah. but uh, it did and then and right that's now become the time you open uh uh, military uh, valor strong. movies, Opened right? The, like yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, what's one call it? Lone Survivor. Give me yes. Which made Lone yeah. Survivor was uh, before though, right? Was before I think. Yeah, that's yeah. thirteen maybe. But yeah, yeah that's, but that's. I become, mean, but does like, Patriots Day here. coming come out that time? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, the yeah. classic like uh, expanded the beginning of right. January thing. Yeah, uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Zero Dark Thirty expanded in January. Yeah, mm -hmm. and did well. Did very well. Yes, those yeah. movies all did well. Black right. Hat. Seeing here like, opened at number eleven for four million dollars. So so that's an issue. It's so embarrassing to open outside, outside the top of the ten, 10 is in like, tough. especially in a dead time of year. Yeah, like even if you have a big movie below coming the out. fifth weekend of Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb. <sighs> you know, like that's where it's opening below right, that. Right. Below the fourth week of Unbroken. How many movies don't exist? I was the Academy? only person at my screen. So you went to see it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I went to see it too. There was also some storm. I think we talked about that. Griffin, there was like a oh, there was a big snowstorm. Because yeah. I went to see the last screen of Black Hat with the fear that You'd be uh, in I the might theater. be snowed in. I had this uh, weird experience at Sundance because um, you know Sundance was a little while after, right, right after this, right. And I was supposed to go to a screening of um, oh god, what was the uh, the um, the Wolf Pack? I remember. Oh sure, sure, sure. And I went to the, the I like got on the wrong bus or something like that. It happened. And and I'd been thinking that day, I was like, you know, I should maybe go see Black Hat because it's like the last day that it's going to be in theaters. It was clearly going to be like, – it was a Thursday night. And I got on the wrong like Sundance show. I actually did not get on a Sundance show. I actually got, got on, on a, a bus. bus. right? And at the point when I realized that I was like going the wrong way and I was totally out of the way, I was like, oh, I got to get off this bus. I got to get off – I get off the bus and I – I, I am standing in front of a mall with a theater showing Black Hat. Oh, yeah. And it's nice. like, but I, I wound up going to, you know, like the, the publicists came and got me and I had to go see, uh, the you know, the Wolf Pack. The Wolf Pack. But I was like, this this is a sign from God. Like, I was I was here for the final show of Black Hat and I could have gone to see it, Should've but gone. I didn't. Yeah. Okay, this answer is not as good as I thought it was going to be, but I want to ask you two guys. Okay. Anyway. Sure. How many Academy Award winners appear in Night of the Museum 3, Secret of the Tomb? Winners. Winners. Jesus. I thought it was five. Is Robin Williams in it? Correct. So that's one. Okay. Uh, Amy, Amy Adams is in it, she's right? In she's two. She's not she's one. In two. She's in and two, she only a nominee. Uh, give me some clues here. I, I forgot that Mickey Rooney had never won, but he's in it, but he's only been nominated. Well, he has an honorary Oscar. Yeah. Does that count? Right. Hugh Jackman, who's been nominated, didn't win. Sure. Ben Stiller. If you want to count, if you want to count Mickey Rooney, it's four. There are two other people who have won Best Lead Actor who are in Night the Museum 3, Secret of the Tomb. Give me a clue. Oh, well, Rami Malek. Correct. Because he plays oh, yeah. like a uh, pharaoh or yeah, something, yeah. right? I believe he plays King Tut. Yeah. Sure. Right. Is that possible? Yeah. He's, he's or, kind or of the main Ramses or somebody like that. character. Yeah. Maybe he's Ramsey. Uh, uh, he plays uh, Achman Ra. Ben is fully checked out at this point. And then I believe his father... In the film, his yep, father? yeah, correct. He's credited as Ox father, Ben, ben Kingsley. Kingsley. I literally, you, you could have let me guess <laughs> that. Guessed. I didn't even know he was in it. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, Sir who ben would, King. who, what, who would you like lazily cast? Right. What Oscar winner will you lazily cast in the third night of the museum to play an Egyptian god or whatever? Dan Stevens. And he would say yes. Rebel Wilson, sure. Ricky Gervais, oh, God. Dick Van Dyke. 
Dick Van Dyke. Mm. Dick Is Van he Dyke. No, no, and it's actually a big shame. Hmm. All right, it's actually it's actually a big shame. So number two at the box office. Mm-hmm. Um, is uh, a new film. Mm. What's the disparity in numbers between American Sniper and number two? This movie opens to 25. Wow. Yeah. It's a good counter There are two huge openings this week. Wow. Black Hat is the non-huge opening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Who knew this would end up being such a blockbuster weekend? Okay. It opens to 25. What's its final gross? Good question. And this is an expansion. This is a proper January release. Yes. Okay. Final Girl 76, mm. Worldwide 268. Mm. Uh, spawned a sequel that everybody loves. You being sarcastic? No. The sequel is loved. Yes. More than the first? Yes. But I think you and I think opposite. Oh, oh, we're talking about our main man, Paddington. Paddington. Which we get dragged a lot. And I think Paddington 1 is better by a hair. By a single bear's hair. I yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, th- I think they're essentially equivalent. I mean, I tweet this thing that I think Parabellum is the best of the three John Wick movies, but I also think those movies are essentially equal. Uh, I agree. I think they just work as a whole, and I want to spend as much time in the John Wick universe and the much time in the Paddington universe as I can until, of course, uh, Paddington versus Wick, Dawn of Justice. Bill, do you care about the Paddington movies? I like them. Yeah. I like them. I, I, I had to review both of them and... Gave him good reviews. I love. I thought. I thought. You know, Hugh Grant. Yeah. Really, kind yes. of deserved. Knuckles an Oscar. McGinty. Yeah. yeah. Knuckles McGinty. Yeah. Brandon Gleeson. Knuckles McGinty. Um, yeah. No. I, I actually. And it's as as a parent, it's actually really nice when movies like that come around and super fucking and, well made. Yeah, and you can actually like take your child to them multiple times yeah. without feeling incredibly guilty. I'll say also, I I would never wish this fate upon him. Yeah. But don't you every time there's a new fucking Disney quote-unquote, live-action adaptation, go, like, I wish they'd just let Paul King do this. Right. Like, he's the only guy who fucking is able to capture this shit. Yeah. Like, Mary Poppins Returns should have been directed by Paul King. I, I love Favreau's Jungle Book. I like Favreau's I, 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 I like, Jungle genuinely Book. love that movie. I like it. So I'm also, you know... So you're kind of in on Lion King. I am... The thing is, I'm not a big fan of Lion King. Me neither. You know, no, the original. None of us are. Yeah. yeah. So I... I mean... I mean, it's... It, you know, it's like like I, it's I trust Favreau to do a decent job with it, but who the hell knows? So I had predicted it was going to be the highest grossing film in history. I predicted this about two years ago. Yeah. I was doubling down and down and down and down until the recent spat of marketing that <laughs> uh, reminded everyone, uh, most of all me, that uh, most of these animals are gross looking <laughs> and lack personality <laughs> in real life. Yeah, they're not and as charismatic. Now I'm worried the movie won't connect because I feel like I the, gonna make the animals in Jungle Book were a lot more stylized. I think it's still going to connect. I think it'll be maybe the sixth highest grossing movie in history. I don't think it's going to end up being number one. But I don't think it's going to be number one. I don't know. I think it was very wrong. I'm, I, I think it will be interesting after this year when, you know, Disney has Avengers, mm-hmm. has an Endgame, has Episode Nine, mm-hmm. and this, which will probably be one of the biggest live action. It'll be one of the ten After this films, year, yeah. like – They'll never have another year no. like this one. No. This like this will kind of be. And Toy Story 4. And, and Toy Story 4. Two. Yeah. And Frozen 2. They're going to have the two biggest yeah. animated movies of all time. The and biggest superhero this, movie of all time. And after yeah. this, you are just going to he- see articles about Disney struggling because they right. are never going to be able to match what they Someone do Someone tweeted year. today, but yeah. just like, you know, good for them. They're going to have an incredible year. Well deserved. I do not pity the person who has to sell their profits next year. And if you think about it, to, and, and to it's their actually, investors. And it's kind of across the board too with the studios. Yeah. Like this is we're sort of coming to the end of the franchises that define the era this of the David's temple. David's big argument right? is that everything's I mean, been shaped around these franchises and yeah. most of those franchises are hitting their cycle ends and yeah. next year looks really weird. Oh yeah. And 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 at the same time for the other studios, a lot of the other kind of big franchises have died. Yeah. Right? I mean Transformers isn't making the kind of money it used to. No. Yeah. And they need Pirates to Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. is over. And and um, in both those cases it's yep, very it's clear that the lesson yeah. is like we need to give it some time. Like they yes. can't force it again. Right. Yeah. Um, here's Disney's 2020 onward, which, what do you think of that trailer? Uh, I agree. Yeah. I Although if it. it wants to be like Dungeons and Dragons, I'm all in, but it kind of looks like, you know, I was very excited. Six of one. I was later. very excited by the premise. Sure. I will admit I auditioned for that movie. You did. You did. I believe I did not get the part. You don't think so? I think I did not receive the lead I've, role in Onward. I've, I've heard otherwise, but this is, <laughs> rumors. it Look, remains are, to be seen. There are persistent rumors. The last I check, 
I am not top build on the poster for Onward. <laughs> so that's my argument against me being in it. Right. Uh, who knows? All right. I would love to be as surprised as everyone else. Uh, yeah, I think it looks okay. I, I find the premise very exciting. I hope it's just a bad trailer. Which Pixar movies often are kind of crummy. Do you know what the actual plot is? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you allowed to? Are you allowed to tell us? No, maybe I, I'm not allowed. Okay. okay so okay. then, yeah, I won't say anything. All right. Onward. Mulan. Yeah, which I, you know, I am excited by the fact that Nikki Haro is directing that. Sure. I like her a lot. I like Whale Ride. Uh, did you see McFarland USA? No. I, I saw McFarland. I liked I McFarland. McFarland, 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 McFarland USA. McFarland USA is actually like secretly kind of a great movie. See, the, see the, I agree with this. And the fact that she did that within the Disney system yeah, right, right, makes right. me think like Mulan might be kind of cool. It's got a really cool cast. I'm not opposed to Mulan. Like yeah. Mulan is the kind of thing where I'm like, have at it. Oh, yeah. I don't have enough affection for the original where I'm like, you're, it's a sacred cow. And this like, is the other reason I'm hate kind of excited for yeah. Mulan because Mulan doesn't have that same legendary status yeah. where they have to hit the same beats. Yeah, I think it does I for think there's a like, little a certain quadrant. No, but, I was, but like, I was the Mulan age. The age yeah. There are people who obviously love Mulan, yeah. but I just think they're allowed a little more freedom yeah. in how they can make Agreed. more historically also, accurate. Yeah, also because its sources are so kind of right. eclectic and diverse, and it's just like a bunch of different myths kind of. You I think know, Mulan like, could be cool. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe the trailer Agreed. comes out and Mulan is chunky. Right. Onward. Mulan. Yeah. Okay. Mulan Marvel chunky. 1, which I think a lot of people assume is Black Widow. Uh, yes. Uh, Artemis Fowl, which got bumped to Memorial Day from August. Uh-huh. Uh, the Kenneth Branagh. About a child thief. Yeah, which could it, that that's a franchise if it hits because there's like a lot of the books. There's a lot of books, right? But who knows? Yeah, it feels a little past its. I mean, peak cultural relevancy. But go on. But you never know. Uh huh. Untitled Pixar, whatever that is. Uh, yeah, right. There's supposed to be two Pixar's next. Mm-hmm. Year. Yeah, Jungle Cruise. Yeah, now look, we both love John Calatzera. This is my no big... idea if it's a big box office player, but like I'm oh, hoping. I'm, you know, sign me up. Yeah. Uh, the one and only Ivan. I have no idea what that is. That's a weird, it's like animals in a zoo. Mike White wrote it. It's about like a polar bear or something. I don't know. Okay. Another, off a so, sounds great. Yeah, it Mar- sounds kind of rad. Another Marvel, which I think people so, assume is Eternals. Correct. So I like believe that's, that's a presumption. Uh, you know, a bit of a, both, both Marvels this year are kind of, you know, like, let's see if this goes. Right? Chloe Zhao making a movie that right as of now, apparently stars Richard Madden, Kumail Nanjiani and Angelina, Angelina Jolie. Jolie which sounds is, great. Sounds pretty fucking cool. Uh, uh, some kind of uh, whatever the Disney movie is, the animated Disney movie. That's like a Thanksgiving project. Oh yeah, because they Disney. canceled a bunch of them. And I don't know what Cruella, that's supposed to be. Which yeah. like okay, so like that's like what well, like you're saying like a period for some of reason, uncertainty exactly. is the yes. beginning. 2019 was cast as this insane year where they add Fox. They have a Star Wars, a Frozen, a right. Toy Story, a Marvel. Uh, uh, did, like, it, you know, it like, actually makes me wonder, game. like, do they know something that we don't? Like, are the billionaires, like, getting ready to kind of pull up the, the, <laughs> the walls gonna... and get on their boats <laughs> while the rest VR. of us fucking drown and burn and die? <laughs> it honestly oh, feels boy. that way. They're like, okay, so we have to, let's just agree, by 2019, we end the Infinity Saga. Yeah, we yeah, end yeah, Star yeah. Wars. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. need some closure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let yeah. them go out happy before even, we leave them stranded on their shitty dying planet. Like even yeah, 2021 exactly. yeah. has Avatar and yeah, I mean, Indiana po- Jones. Poor like, James Cameron is there. like, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here to save the day, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like as, you, as he's drowning. <laughs> do you think that's part of those movies getting pushed back? Is that like James Cameron knows when the Earth is going to expire better than anyone else, and he's like. Okay, we got a couple more years, so let me just push off the Avatar announcement. <laughs> the Avatar movie is going to come out after humanity dies yeah, on yeah, Earth. Yeah, yeah, right. And he'll be like, yeah, no, it's finished. It's finished. You can come look at it. Ah, too bad. Roads yeah. don't exist. It's uh, in Canada. My movie's yeah, in Canada. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, we, I think we all agree that the future of the movie industry is very interesting and in flux. I, always, I just always get annoyed at anyone who writes the article that's like, this is it. It's definitive. X, you know, like, you know, because of like six months of box office growth, like, you know, like, here's, you know. here's the thing that I'm interested in right now is just like, what, what is, cause I feel like for the last five or six years, minus uh, 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 a fucking funny guy like me throwing a, a Lion King argument into the mix, there's been like a clear, like, this is going to be the highest grossing film of the year. Uh huh. This is coming out. This will be the sure, highest grossing right, film of the year. Right. You can call it a year out in advance. I don't know if there is one next year. Yeah, I don't either. Like, there are big movies, but I don't know if there's a, like, well, obviously... Everyone's going to go see This is just going to demolish. Yeah. Joker. 
Is, well, no, Joker comes out this it's year. This ben. year, it's going to change the world. Even better, Tenet. 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 That's right. Peter Rabbit two, Sonic the Hedgehog, Voyager, Doctor Doolittle, Godzilla vs Kong. Is, I'm looking at other thing. studios things now. I'm telling you, it's, New it's Mutants, insane. James Bond twenty five comes out in April. Let's see if that sticks. But Bond, right? One assumes Bond will come out that year. Trolls That's World two, World Tour. Sorry, Fast and Furious nine, Wonder Woman. That's twenty twenty now. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Minions: The Rise of Gru. Well, yeah. All right. Maybe that's your number one. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, t- t- Wait, is Michael Mann directing that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Top Gun. This guy Gru. He's a. Uh, what, yeah. what voice am I doing now? That's yeah. not Michael Mann. You yellow fuck. <laughs> you dumb egg. Um, they do He's look kind of look like, like dumb eggs. Uh, Ghostbusters: The Rise of Boys Again. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, this. These are weird. Like, there's a lot of untitled blank event films. Uh, Morbius, the Jared Leto Morbius movie that everyone's been demanding. What's Venom Two? That uh, should be twenty twenty. Uh, let's see. I don't know. I don't see it here on the schedule. Maybe I mean, it's it might be untitled Sony. It says, you know what? Here it says twenty twenty untitled Sony Marvel sequel. So that's probably Venom Two. Yeah. What else? Unless it's uh, Into the Spider Verse or something like that. It could sure, be Sure, Spider Verse Two or Spider Man right. Junior Year. You know, whatever. This is a weird list of <laughs> like. There's so many of these when like Black Panther Two. Is that twenty twenty one? Everyone, yeah. there's like a Marvel like February twenty twenty one that everyone assumes is Black Panther. Yeah. There's so I many of Feige these will like soon uh, do this thing where he's like. Here it is, folks. Here, the logos of the movies that right. have not been written or cast yet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Untitled Universal Event Film 4. Well, that actually, that sounds really good. That might be a big one. Untitled <laughs> WB Event Film 2. <laughs> yeah, what if I'm working for Deadline and I'm like, everyone knows that Untitled Universal <laughs> Event Film 4 is the most, the safest bet of the summer. We all know this. <laughs> Untitled Amblin Project. Like, what is an event film? Green Book Every, 2. Black Hat's know. an event <laughs> film. There's <laughs> events. Yes, I do love when they just call yes. an event film where it's like, what does that mean? It means it's not a superhero movie or animated, but like, I don't know, some shit will happen. Well, like here, we'll this is a like or two. untitled universal event comedy. This isn't just some untitled universal comedy. They're calling it <laughs> right. this That's where be. they're like, look, Kevin Hart is choice number one. If he passes, we're going to call <laughs> right. up, I don't like, you know, Rebel Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, get, get off your phone. Okay, sorry. I feel, I feel like you're getting sucked into all the untitled events of the I'm, next 50 I'm years. Go on. What about this one? I mean, Un- untitled Affirm Films Coach Project. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, could literally be anything. I, I mean, isn't, isn't Affirm, Affirm Films one of those yeah, sort of inspirational movies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're now staking but like, out half untitled. the movies are about coaches, so that right. really could be anything. It is, yeah, there's some guy whose job is like, every week there's an article of, in any local newspaper about a coach. Yeah. Send it to me and I will deem it. I'll see if it's yeah. inspirational yeah. enough. Right. Untitled they, 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 Affirm they got Coach Goog- They got their film. Google alert for yeah. coach yeah. and like dead Triumph. child you know, yeah. <laughs> right. and they have their Easter weekend After release date tragedy right yeah. they're just waiting for the right cor- yeah. coach yeah, story he's like an old Coma. fucking call who's an Oscar winner from the 90s who needs work right you know, what like, if that slot ends up just being a, a movie adaptation of Craig T. Nelson's coach a firm was like we couldn't find one it's just here we took an episode that's what will start to happen they'll be like yeah. We think there's a lot of, uh, you know, potential for Major Dad the movie, right? Like, it'll become that. <laughs> hey, it's a brand name. People know Major Dad. He's a major. They're going to do dad. a Golden Girl cinematic universe where yeah. each of them have their, have their own film. Yeah, right, right. It's, the, it's just young Patrillo Blanche. Origins, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just love saying colon origins. That's like my favorite stupid studio pitch Sophia ever. Patrillo origins Wolverine. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, we're, oh, there are no good jokes left. Well, now we're done with man. I mean, we're going to have a bonus episode. We're done with Michael Mann. We're going to do the bonus of uh, Miami Vice pilot, which yeah. we've talked about a lot today, and that'll come out Which he Thursday. didn't direct, but didn't direct. obviously his fingers are We always try to throw in a little bonus. That's something they didn't direct, but it's sort of connected to them in some way. What's your favorite man, Bilgo? That's we'll a good do question. in the bonus, but do you ha- could you pick a favorite? Uh, it has to be Heat. I agree. I mean, Heat is like in my all-time top five, six, seven movies. Mm-hmm. But, like, I mean, gun to my head, if I had to, like, watch a Michael Mann movie mm-hmm. right this minute, I, I think I'd pick Miami Vice. Wow. That's the one two. I can't stop watching. Wow. But, like, you know. You're, the, you're a fiend for Vice. I am a fiend for Vice. Vice he does. Um, vice he does. <laughs> Don't you wish we had a theme restaurant just so we could name dishes like that? You know what I'm saying? 
yes, of course I do. Sounds yeah. great. I wish we could have a punny menu and just have a restaurant that's like celebrating all of our favorite movies, like our own planet. We should buy a planet Hollywood, David. You like, and I. Just like a disused and yeah. turn it into like Griffin and David's blank check, you know, food bag. Griffin and it's David like those, present it's dinner. Like, oh, no, 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 it's like those, uh, it's like those, uh, there used to be a restaurant in D.C., uh, it was called Cities. Uh -huh. And I don't know if it's still there. It might be. But like, you know, every year or something like that or every season, it would be a different city. They have rules. Right. So like that would be what you oh, do. Oh, like, we would theme, re -theme the restaurant right, to the mini right. series. Yeah, exactly. So it would be well, like for 12 weeks only, like Michael Mann's dinner. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was even thinking we could like just put out recipes. Right. So we could put out like our Michael Mann nachos and then everyone can make their own nachos. And eat along, or you could to the yeah, podcast. Just, you could solicit recipes. You could say right. if you were if you were to make a dish called Michael Mann nachos, okay. what would be in it? My, Michael Manicotti. <laughs> nice. hey, it's Manicoy. <laughs> Thief quiche. That doesn't really work. I'm trying to think. Michael Mann does. Does he eat? Like he doesn't strike me as someone who's like the, the like I, a gourmet. I, I think he owns a restaurant. Fuck. Really? I believe he owns. I I could be what wrong if about he made the, a restaurant. I believe movie. he owns a restaurant in Miami. He's a guy. Mm. Oh, David, like a look it up. Owner. Look it up right now. But he is a guy where I would believe you if you told me like no, he just takes spoonfuls of protein powder. You, given how many like diner scenes are in his movies, yeah. though, you know. Yes. Uh. The but like that. That now I want him to make a kitchen movie because yeah. it. That's also about like people under pressure. Like barking at each other. Like his and version like, of Big Night. Like yeah, exactly. people would die. Yeah. Professionalism <laughs> that consumes you. He should have directed yeah. Burnt. He should have made Burnt. Burnt? Oh, he could have done like, Burnt. Like Michael Mann working with Bradley Cooper would probably be a blast. Bradley, like, Bradley Cooper, Cooper yeah. is one of those only movie stars oh, yeah, yeah. left. I feel right. like Bradley Cooper. Obsessive occupation. The chef is like one yes. of the most obsessed. Right, right. Where it's like you're completely, you don't have a personal life. Cooper and DiCaprio feel like the two info. guys who could get Michael Mann a green light today. Mm -hmm. yeah. they'd have to work on it like it wouldn't be an easy green light no, but, but I feel no, like those two guys with the right source material and being like I'll look over them yeah I'll make sure the thing gets done on time right um, anyway we're gonna put the blank check millions into buying a Planet Hollywood yeah yeah contribute to our Patreon so that we can own a restaurant <laughs> we'll end it's up just, like Michael Clayton it's gonna be like in an airport like it's gonna be in like O'Hare yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like a counter. You know you know how there was that big lawsuit where they had all the Cheers locations at airports and there was like a robot George Went and a robot John Ratzenberger and they would just sort of like talk at the bar so you could feel like you were at Cheers. Okay. And the two of them sued and then the people who in the restaurants were like, no, these aren't your characters. This is just a fat, depressed man and <laughs> fact-obsessed mailman. <laughs> <laughs> and they like won so much money in the lawsuit that right. all of them got shut down. We should also buy those robots and retrofit them, put right. them in our clothes. <laughs> so buy Planet Hollywoods, buy the robots from Cheers, and then it's just the two of us, and they just are playing uh, the box office game yeah. eternally. Yeah, so you can sit there and be like, oh my god, I'm there. Griffin yeah. isn't looking at his phone. Also, there's no chefs. There's no waiters. No. This thing you would lose. Just, you just go, and it's a mess. It takes like three hours this, for your meal to come this out. This thing we're pitching would make Black Hat look proper. <laughs> <laughs> It would lose the most money in history. We'd be like in the record books, but like, oh, oh, the worst business proposition the of number all time. one. Right. Yeah. Uh, Bilga, thank you so much for thank being you. here. This was fun. Uh, always a pleasure. Yes. Uh, my my mom has uh, called your your previous appearance, the Dunkirk episode, the most relaxing uh, podcast episode she's oh, ever no. listened to. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, she's like, he's like a very relaxing man. Yeah. Uh, it was meant purely as a compliment. She was okay. like, I was like really stressed out. That is funny, though, considering that Dunkirk is, is one, like, of the one, one of the most movies ever made. Nerve wracking yes. film yes. ever made. Oh, she was like, I've listened to that episode like 10 times because I find him very relaxing. Jeez, that's nice. Wow. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, take that to the bank. Should, Add that oh, to your resume. A, start with an. A ASMR. I was going to say, uh, yeah. we've had some ASMR -y guests, and you're one yeah. of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Miriam Bale is very ASMR. Yeah. Some of them, you know, some people have very. Oh. Vanderwerf, I find voices. very relaxing yeah. on the mic. Yeah. 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 You, you, I mean, look, it's, maybe this is a little spent. Maybe this, maybe this is a profitable venture. <laughs> David's rubbing, rubbing his hands together. together. That's ASMR. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's Michael Mann. And then uh, there's no there's no palate cleanser. In no, between, we we we're we're we're, we're, we're going straight into in Miyazaki, the castle of I'm gonna fuck up the name again, Cagliostro. Yeah, that's the right. I got it's it. The castle of Cagliostro. It's right, yeah. right. Uh, Howl's Moving Podcast. I was about to say. I thought yeah, Howl's Moving Podcast was the title. Yes. Um. So yeah, going uh, uh, 
uh, I was, I don't know. I was go buy your Miyazaki DVDs. Or go find out when it's playing in theaters near you because they're playing all around the country. That's or go to your local library. Go That's to your true. local library. We love libraries and we're going to buy a library and turn it into something else too. <laughs> we're going to lose all our money. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Anne Gudo for our social media. Joe Bowen, Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Lee Montgomery for our theme song. Go to blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to Tee Public for some real nerdy shirts. Uh, go to our Patreon uh, for... Uh, the, the Michael Mann bonus episodes we've done, including the uh, us playing the keep role playing game, uh, and our continuing trek through uh, the the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, via commentary, uh, and as always, uh, black black hat hat and black hat hat.